We are recording. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank you. It is 9.07 a.m. Mr. Del Castillo, can we start with the roll call, please? Yes, good morning. Uh, Mr. McGregor. Present. Ms. Bagley. Here. Did you hear me? Yes. Okay, Ms. good. Bagley, thank you. Trouble. Uh, a lot of trouble. Mr. Reeves. I'm here. Mr. Hall. Here. Mr. Baring. Here. Commissioner Popkin. Not here. Vice Chair Blair. I'm here. And Chair Hampton. Present. Thank you, Mr. Dale Castillo. Um, welcome to the Zoning Ordinance Advisory Committee meeting. It is August 16th. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a recap, but if I may, or outline for today's meeting agenda. Um, Mr. King, we are only able to see the speakers. I don't know if you're able to change the video format for those of us here at City Hall so that we can see all the members who are online. So good morning. Thank you for everyone for being here. Um, we have one agenda item with a number of registered speakers. Um, to maximize our time, we're going to begin with our staff briefing to provide an update from our last meeting, um, including responses to questions from our committee. Uh, we do have a number of public speakers here today, so to allow for committee discussion and to hear from the maximum number of speakers, if there are no objections, I'm going to recommend that we begin with a staff update, followed by member discussion for one hour, allowing approximately two hours for our public speakers. We will take a short recess between discussion and the speakers, just so that everyone can then uh, be back and be online for that. So, as a reminder to all of our speakers here today, those from the July 7th meeting um, that were not able to speak have been carried forward. Uh, we've received a number of questions from those who missed the deadline to register today. As we did at our past meeting, we hear from all of our registered speakers, and if there is anyone here um, who, after the deadline who wishes to speak, as time allows, we will also hear from them today. I believe uh, Mr. Doss has put out a sign-in sheet. You only need to do that if you have not previously registered to speak today. Uh, for the members of the public joining us uh, today, our meeting format is the staff briefing, uh, followed by questions from our members and any commissioners, then our public speakers. Speakers will be limited to one minute each. Speakers should begin with your name and address for the record, and if you are joining us virtually, your camera must be on for us to be able to hear from you. I'd also like to acknowledge that we've had a number of letters um, sent regarding today's case, and those have been shared with all members of the committee. So with that, are there any objections to the member for our proposed order of the agenda? Any objections? Hearing none, we will proceed. Uh, Mr. Doss, welcome back. If you could read the item into the record and provide our briefing update, please. Good morning and thank you. The request before you today, DCA 212002, consideration of amending chapters 51 and 51A of the Dallas Development Code with consideration to be given to amending section 51-4.216.1 lodging uses and section 51A-4.205 lodging uses to define a new use called short-term rental lodging and related regulations. Um, we will go through a little bit of a brief background, um, and then we'll provide some updates that were requested at the last meeting. Um, we do the presentation view on the screens now. Unfortunately, the projectors are not working currently, and we have, um, we're working on switching the video feed for uh, City Hall over to the gallery view um, as requested. So uh, the, this original, originally this code amendment uh, request was initiated by the City Plan Commission on December 2nd, 2021. Um, we've been working uh, on that since, since that day. We had a few ZOAC meetings. We have, uh, we have an updated project website um, 
that includes all of our previous ZOAC meetings and the previous CPC, previous task force, and city council discussions on that webpage. Um, and we will, if we don't already have that link, we will share that link. Um, today's meeting, uh, of course, we're going to have some more discussion. We have public input, and um, we have our responses to ZOAC's uh, requests from our last few meetings. Uh, the first one of those was a map of our existing uh, short-term rentals. So um, this map is a, uh, you can hopefully see it well enough. Um, if we need to zoom in, we can, showing the concentration of our short-term rentals. Um, we have them broken down by both council district and by zoning district. Um, there are a total of, uh, we have these broken down by active and pending registration, and these are from the city controller's office data. So these are properties that are, have registered or are registering in the process to register to pay the hotel occupancy tax as required. Is there a way to keep it on? No, I don't think so. Okay, so um, a total of 2,612 active or pending short-term rentals in the city of Dallas. Um, the largest concentrations, highest concentrations are in council districts one, two, and 14, as you can see from our table. Switching over to zoning districts, um, you can see that the, the highest concentration of short-term rentals by zoning district are in our plan development districts. Um, and within, uh, we have a further breakdown of plan development districts. Um, the highest concentration, um, not by quite as wide a margin, but the highest concentration within plan development districts are in plan development district 193, that's the Oakland Special Purpose District. I don't have the number in front of me, um, but I believe it's about, of the 919 short-term rentals that are in plan development districts, I believe the number is 25 to 30% of those are in uh, Oakland Special Purpose District. So as you can see, PDs uh, have about 35% of the short-term rentals, and then after that, it's uh, R75 with 27%, um, and then there's some in MF2, and there's a reasonably high concentration, about 6% in our conservation districts. Um, so based purely on um, these numbers and the zoning districts that the committee has discussed thus far um, for where potentially short-term rentals could be allowed versus uh, would be prohibited, um, if we move forward with those districts as discussed at the previous meeting, um, that would essentially prohibit about anywhere between 48 and 54% of the existing short-term rentals um, that are currently active. Now that does include, I'm sorry, I have to think about my math a little bit. The low end of that number um, assumes that we do not amend any conservation districts because that would mean individually going in and, and opening every single, conser all 14 conservation districts up. Um, but the high end of that assumes that we we do go in and open all those conservation districts up. Um, we didn't, I did not include PDs in that number, that 48 to 54% assumes that we do not touch any planned development districts because there are 900 of them and that would be, um, it would take a very long time to open all of those planned development districts up to add a use and then prohibit that use. Um, we are still looking at how our, any call forwards would work and how if we change something in the base zone, immediately what effect does that have on PDs that have base districts? We just haven't done a full analysis to see. Some plan development districts just refer straight to 51 or 51A and take everything from them, and some don't. Some have their own definitions, some have their own kind of really specific stipulations. So that would be, um, that's a much deeper dive into every, all 900 plan development districts to see what effect this would have on them. So we, we are, working on that, but we, we were unable to get that um, information for this meeting. So moving on um, to owner occupancy, there were a lot of questions about owner occupancy and what other cities require or how they differentiate. Um, many cities do not, but of those that do that we studied, San Antonio um, allows non-owner occupied and owner occupied short-term rentals. Um, the only difference in treatment is the density limits. So for San Antonio, a non-owner occupied short-term rental 
uh, there's a density maximum or concentration maximum of 12.5% of the units on a block face or 12.5% of the units in a single multifamily building. Um, Owner-occupied and short-term rentals do not have to comply with those standards or those limits, um, and they establish their owner occupancy status uh, by homestead exemption, voter registration, vehicle registration, or similar means. Those three or four um, methods of establishing occupancy are, are common. Most of the cities we studied use a similar list. Uh, for the city of Los Angeles, um, Los Angeles only allows short-term rentals to be operated um, on a property that also has a primary residence um, there. They call it home sharing and not short-term rental. Um, they define the resident, the primary residence is where the host, who's the operator, resides for more than six months of the calendar year, and they establish that by a photo ID, plus voter registration, vehicle registration, a health insurance bill, an auto insurance bill, a pay stub that's fewer than six months old, a lease agreement that is current, or their um, property tax homeowner's exemption. Um, but that is the only, you have to use those things to establish your occupancy, um, in order to operate, to get a permit to operate, a license to operate a, a, a home sharing use, which would be what we would, we're calling a short-term rental. Uh, the city of Denver um, is similar to Los Angeles. It only allows a short-term rental as an accessory to a primary residential use. Um, and the owner, uh, if, if there's a primary residential use, primary residence, like a main house and an accessory dwelling unit, the primary resident, who is the operator, has to live in the main home and the ADU can be the short-term rental. Um, they cannot move into the short-term rental into the ADU and then lease the main house as the short-term rental. They have to reside in the main house and they establish their residency, uh, the same method as Los Angeles and most of the other cities, voter registration, a state ID card, uh, vehicle registration, federal or state tax returns, a utility bill, or any other legal, legal documentation that is approved by the director of the Denver Department of Excise and Licenses. Uh, so um, those are the cities that really differentiate between owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. Um, some other information regarding owner-occupancy. Um, we did research. We had city attorney's office help us on some research into state statute. Um, there appears to be no conflict that we can find in state statute um, with placing an owner-occupancy requirement or standards onto the use. Uh, for zoning regulations, um, basically some what other cities use, the typical zoning regulations focus on either uh, allowing the use or not. Um, so like I said, like Los Angeles and Denver only allow, essentially they only allow owner occupancy, um, but they call it primary residency. So that enables a long-term tenant to operate a short-term rental, um, but not, um, there has to be a long-term permanent resident of that property, whether it's a long-term rental tenant or an owner. Um, where uh, either, so they either say yes or no, you can or can't do it based on owner occupancy, or that spacing or density or concentration limit applies to non-owner non occupied, but does not apply to owner occupied. Uh, so some other questions that we had, um, this is not related to owner occupancy, uh, forgive my uh, not deleting a title out. So um, we, we had this, there was some discussion at our last meeting of short-term rentals, uh, that are in legal dwelling units but are located in non-residential zoning districts. Um, how do we treat those? So we have revised the use table that's in your case report to remove some of those um, those in, uh, zoning districts like light industrial, um, IM, IR, that we had listed as, as short-term rental as a permitted use. Um, we have since deleted those out so they would be prohibited. Um, even if there is a legal dwelling unit, um, it can still be used as such as long as it's conforming or, or legal non-conforming as long as it has its status, but it cannot be used as a short-term rental under the current um, table that is in the case report. Uh, and then for parking standards, so um, in looking at this in nearly all cases, at least in Dallas, um, any existing dwelling unit or a new dwelling unit that is constructed um, is going to have a minimum parking requirement in place. Typically for a single family dwelling unit, that's gonna be one space and uh, per unit and for a multifamily development that's going to be one space per bedroom of course there are a lot of pds a lot of little differences here and there but that's basically the most common requirements um, and of course if more parking is, is desired um, the committee of course can make a recommendation uh, some cities require like one space per sleeping room uh, that's new braunfels 
and then some just require you know one one per rental unit uh, whatever that is um specifically so arlington um, doesn't have a minimum number of parking spaces in their zoning ordinance but in their registration ordinance they limit the parking to what is already present on site um, which in my reading means a guest of a short-term rental is not allowed to park on the street um, but importantly that is in the registration and not the zoning ordinance uh, san antonio requires just a minimum of one parking space per rental unit and new braunfels as i mentioned uh, requires a minimum of one space per sleeping room but the garage does not count so if there's already a garage on the home there still has to be another space um, to meet that minimum requirement of one per sleeping room or two spaces or three um, and we also had some discussion of a purpose statement um, we just wanted to provide some examples from other cities I'm not going to read through all of these but um, the, the general kind of gist of all of them is uh, protection of health safety and well-being um, both for um, current residents of the city of whatever city uh, the purpose statement is for and also uh, for the guests of the short-term rentals to ensure that um, there are at least some some base of of assurance that uh, you're you know, you're going to be going to a place that is uh, you're going to be renting a, a unit that has either been inspected or licensed or permitted in some manner by the city and you're not just going into a complete unknown um, so those are all in your case report um, if you want to review those um, and then of course on i did want to add the note on los angeles that it's um an accessory used to residential only uh, and that would also apply to Denver. Um, they're only allowed when there's a primary residential use on the property. Um, and with that, um, that, that's all my updates. We did, um, Chair Hampton reminded me of the discussion of the multifamily maximum. Um, I, that did not make it into my presentation of the case report. That just emptied, uh, it left my brain. Um, but that, the discussion that was had about that was that six short-term rentals in a multifamily project or 10%, whichever is, lower so if you have a 10 unit complex you can do one but if you have a nine unit complex you can't do any and then once you hit 60 units in your complex you hit your maximum of six and you can't go over that um, so that we will incorporate that into any into our further um, documents case reports and, and um, proposals um, so with that i'm here for any questions and for your discussion Thank you, Mr. Doss. Um, before we open to questions, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, Commissioner Popkin has joined us at 9.20 a.m. and Commissioner Carpenter is also online with us today. Members, questions for staff? Mr. McGregor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wouldn't disappoint and not have a question. Um, I actually have three if it's okay. Can I go through all of them? <clears throat> Mr. Doss, one of the most, uh, well, first, as you know, we've uh, received tons of emails from people uh, against and for. Um, a common argument among the group who are against allowing STRs is that the city would not be able to, um, to enforce the regulations. Can you speak to a couple of things? One is, and one is um, how would the city enforce regulations is, is it in fact correct that the city would not be able to enforce them and the last one is how would that differ from how would enforcement differ if strs are regulated as opposed to if they're straight out um forbidden thank you i'm gonna send that one to mr reed Good morning, Jeremy Reed, Interim Assistant Director for Code Compliance. So a uh, great question on enforcement. So Code Compliance does enforce um, over 900 ordinances. Uh, that's that's our, our primary function is to bring compliance to the, the codes that have been established. Um, if, if we do nothing, uh, the current um, codes don't allow us to address the short-term rentals as they are. So we're left with what are the current nuisance uh, violations on the books right now. If we go either with a across the board prohibition or a allowance with regulations, code compliance is going to be involved as the enforcement arm um, for those provisions e either either way you go. So how, I mean, we're gonna have to have um, uh, a team to, to do that, um, whether it's, you know, the initial uh, registration stage to ensure that properties are registered. Um, that will be something that code compliance will do. If we establish regulations 
um, for the appropriate operation of those short-term rentals. Um, code compliance will be the, um, the enforcement arm of making sure that, um, that they are in compliance, and that's whether they're in the zoning code or in, the, um, in a potential registration code that has been, um, that has been proposed. And so the same, the same will go if we use zoning to prohibit them everywhere or most places. Um, if they were operating, uh, so if we prohibited them, that wouldn't mean they would all go away necessarily. So code compliance would still be involved in um, requiring um, potential illegal operators to, um, to, to cease operations as we do with other zoning code violations. Uh, follow up on that same question. Is there, are you saying that essentially there would not be a significant difference in the city's needs to enforce if it's uh, prohibited versus if it is uh, zoned? The, the amount of work for code compliance would probably change, um, and depending on how long term that would be, um, but we would need to be involved either way, and there would be enforcement that wouldn't be needed either way. Thank you. Can I do another one? Um, Mr. Dawes, I, I got lost a little bit in, in the, when you broke down where the current STRs are and you spoke about 48 to 54 percent being in PDs. Um, what, what I was trying to learn from that and I didn't quite pick it up is um, I'd be very interested to know how many of the current uh, STRs are operating in single family neighborhoods or, or duplex type neighborhoods. And I know in a PD it's difficult to establish because it's not uh, base zoning, uh, but can, can you speak to that or did your data give you any information on that? It did. So um, ignoring plan development districts, which are 35% of short-term rentals, uh, again, that are either active or pending registration with the city controller's office, um, we're looking at about 37% in the R districts. So that's R5. R75, R1 acre, R10, R1 half acre, R16, and R13. Um, that's about 37%. So there's a greater concentration in R zoning districts than in plan development districts. And when you add in the duplex, there's another 3% in duplex districts, another 6% in conservation districts, which are mostly single family, um, not historic, but, but older neighborhoods. Um, and then there are an additional 9% in MF2A zoning districts, which um, the, I don't have a breakdown of in the MF2A zoning district, which units are in single family, because you, you can do single family in those MF2A districts. Um, I don't know what the breakdown is between multifamily and single family, but you know, almost 10% of the short-term rentals are in MF2A zoning district. Um, and there's another 3% in MF1. Thank you. That, that answers my question. Um, the last uh, question I have for now is uh, you mentioned the parking regulations in other cities. And um, I'm struggling a little bit with that because, um, well, actually, it's not a question. It's just, it's my, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that one. And I'll probably come back during the discussion process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. So for our members online at the moment, I can't see everyone, so please speak up uh, if you have a question. Other questions from the members? Commissioner Popkin. Just catching up on the presentation and looking through some of the data, I was wondering, um, on page three, I believe, of this morning's presentation, the map of existing STRs, it mentions that there's 919 STRs and PDs, how would this proposed language impact those? So currently the proposal is to create a use and then add a list of districts that that use is allowed in. Um, each individual PD is gonna be different. Um, some PDs will say something like, um, you know, the base of this PD is R75A, and except for these five things over here, it's just, it operates just like that. In that case, if, if they don't say something about short-term rentals, which most of them won't, um, then it's gonna pull straight from R75A and they'd be prohibited. But that's not the case for every PD, and I can't tell you unless I go and look at the PD. Um, so there's gonna be a mix of, some of them are going to be prohibited in this PD because of the language of the PD, some of them aren't, some of them 
we're not really going to know. We're going to have to do a lot of research and, and find out. So it's that piece is the hardest piece, and, and that's part of the struggle with having so many PDs in the city, is that each one of them is an individual district and has its own little stipulations, and there can be one sentence or one word in there that completely changes how you apply a base zoning district requirement. So it's okay, really so it's going to primarily depend on the base zoning district for that PD and how STRs are applied to those general base districts, and then yes. there may be other factors that come into play. Most likely there will be other factors in that PD. There will be something in the PD that says that, you know, all, you know, we, we pull everything except for this little piece from R75A. Or, you know, we're, we're R75A, but we're non-residential. There's, there's a whole lot of little moving pieces that go into it. Um, if I had to, I can't even really honestly take a guess because there's 900 of them. And yeah. we would have to look at all of them to see because they're all going to be a little bit different um, depending on when they were written, who wrote them, et cetera. So that will need to be something that we familiarize ourselves with as plan commission in upcoming cases, both dealing with previously written PDs and PDs written in the future, it could be specified that STRs are or are not allowed, but those re that's really not included in previous PDs, so that would be something that we would look at on a case-by-case -case basis then. So for, for new PDs, um, the way that they, they're written now, um, you'll see it, because it'll, it'll come through as this is a base 7.5, and in the case report, it's gonna tell you, are they modifying any uses? And if they're not modifying any uses, if a use is not allowed in R75, and the PD is based on R75, then it's not allowed because they're not changing any uses. Your case report says, well, we're gonna change a use, so we're gonna add this, take this out, do this, then you'll know. So is short-term rental then lumped in with hotel where any PD that, for example, allows hotel is then allowed? So there are some PDs that allow use by category um, so category is the broader, of course, category, and by putting short-term rental lodging in the lodging category, um, if a PD does say, let's say, for example, a PD says, and I, you know, this is, I'm completely making this up, but my PD says I am R75A base, um, but hotel uses are allowed, or lodging uses are allowed, as in 4.205, um, then yes, the short-term rental would be allowed because we place short-term rental in the lodging use category and that PD says that you can do lodging uses. Um, now, is that the case? I don't know if that PD exists. But if a PD says we only allow residential uses, that's a use category. The short-term rental, as proposed or as discussed, is not in that residential category, so it would not be allowed by that language. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Thank you, Commissioner Popkin. Just one follow-up, Mr. Doss, on that um, line of thought. So if we look in our case report, we have lodging uses. I'm actually on the right one on the hotel. So districts where lodging uses are allowed, if those are the base reference for the PD, then if the short-term rental uses is added to the lodging district, it would be allowed. Is that a correct summary? It's on page 14 of our case report. So if, if there is a, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? So I'm, I'm under appendix three, page 14 of our case report, lodging uses, for instance, hotel or motel. And so if I am in a by right district, M-O-G-O-R-R-C-S-L-L-I-R-I-M, central area, the list that is, is in the category, if the short-term rental is added within lodging uses, then it would also be allowed. And again, we're gonna define, just like this does, the districts it's allowed in, and so then it would be an allowed use by right. Is that correct? That is correct with the, I'm not sure where the table went. We did have a full use table. That would be appendix two. Yes, appendix two, so I need to turn back a page. So. That's the, that's the question for the committee, uh, commission and council to determine is which, what is the appropriate list of allowed districts? Um, so we provided in appendix two, uh, we mirrored lodging or boarding house um, with some modifications. So um, 
what we would do, and, and you know, I think you've seen in Appendix 1, not Appendix 1, somewhere, in the case report, let's say on page 6, no, page 5, um, that uh, item 3, uh, paragraph B, districts permitted. Um, so currently we have that table in Appendix 2, we would write that list and say these are the districts allowed by right. Um, if a PD was written that said, um, if it was, if it said we follow the zoning, uh, the, the uses that are allowed in, for example, a uh, MF3A zoning district, um, you can go to the MF3A uh, line on the, on the use chart and see that there's a P for permitted and short-term rental lodging. So in that PD, because that PD says I follow MF3, it's allowed. Unless the PD also says, except I don't allow short-term rental lodging, or I don't allow hotels, or I don't allow X, Y, and Z. Um, so each PD is going to have a general set of go to the base zoning and follow these rules, and then it's going to have normally a set of, well, accept these rules that I want to change. Um, so that's where the nuance comes in um, as we get new PDs in, um, and that's what the City Plan Commission does is they review those, staff reviews those, City Plan Commission reviews those, and Council reviews those. Okay, and just to re-clarify, the use table that we have, so this was staff utilized, just as you said, where existing lodging uses are allowed as a base. We then had discussion at our last meeting about districts where there are no residential uses, primarily um, the RR, CS, LI, IR, and I am, and those are now struck in the table that's in our case report today. Is that correct? That is correct. It's a little hard to see, but they are. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Mr. Reeves, I believe you had your hand raised. Yes. Let me get back to where I was really quick. Um, follow up on the conservation district's um, statement. I think the answer would be somewhat exactly like you said for PDs. Is that correct? That is correct. It would, each conservation district has its own set. Some of them follow strictly a base zoning district. Some of them have their own sets of uses. But in general, it would be the same as, as a plan development district. Okay, so I'll read an example. For full disclosure, I live in the Vickery Place um, Conservation District, and I was instrumental in, in uh, passing that back in the day. And I know that we looked at the M Streets uh, uh, the M Streets, we looked at M Streets West, we looked at Belmont, we looked at a bunch of difference. And, and our first statement says, except as otherwise prohibited, provided in this Exhibit B, the development standards of the R75 single district, single family district apply in this district. So our conservation district, like I know most of them here in East Dallas, specifically say we're basing it on R75 unless we say different. And then everything else that's different, it has nothing to do with... Um, hotels or hostels or anything like that. It's just, you know, location, setbacks, garages, et cetera, et cetera. So by that statement, um, and I realize you're not reading all the exceptions, but if, if you were to read all the exceptions and it said nothing about um, hotels or anything like that, then um, whatever we did here in R75 or any of the R districts would apply to this conservation district. Is that a true statement? That is correct. Uh, yes. Okay. So, se second point to last week, we are uh, last session. We said there were about six thousand. Best we could figure, about six thousand STRs in the city of Dallas. So, I did want to point out, or allow you to point out, that your numbers, although um, very very educational with the percentages for sure, it's probably less than. Um, it's probably just a third. A third to 40% of what is actually out there. Is that correct? I, I, unfortunately, I can't really speak to any, any data other than that which I've been given. Okay. All right. Well, just to remind everybody, last week we did say that there was a lot more out there, and the conversation was is if we could get half of them to register. Um, and I was like, you know, half is that what we're shooting for? So, Anyway, so um, back to multifamily, um, did you address, um, you had said uh, in multifamily, six or 10%, whichever is lower. Was that MF2 or was that all the multifamily districts? 
that is up for discussion as of this point. Okay. And has staff looked at the, the density bonus for affordable housing? Uh, my example last week, we could be giving somebody, uh, you know, for 5% of their affordable housing, we're giving them a big density bonus. But with this, they could turn around and give 10% of those units, not the affordable units that so they would have, let's say, you know, six affordable units, and they could turn around and have 12 STRs, um, which it completely defeats the purpose of uh, affordable housing, in my humble opinion. Has staff given any consideration to that? So the, the limit, as discussed, was um, the, the, the lesser of 10% of the total units or six. Um, so there is no situation in which there could be more than six short-term rentals for a, a property. Um, however, if, if that number is, is not um, what the committee wants to recommend, then that's also up for discussion. So, so we could possibly say if you get if you have taken advantage of the affordable density bonus, then you don't get any short term rental. We could say that and make it simple, right? Because you would know if somebody's, you know, straight MF MF zoning or they've got the density bonus. Is that correct? So I'll have to do more research on that. the The density bonus comes into play at permitting, so um, it's kind of a after after zoning is done all their work, because um, at any point that density bonus can just be not used by the developer and they can build what what is but their buy right development rights without providing any affordable housing and without getting the bonuses. Um, I, I would have to look into also where we would place any sort of STR prohibition for a project that uses that. It may have to go in to a different section of code um, that isn't isn't under the authorization that wasn't authorized in the memo we have before us today, but we'll do some research on that and and see if that if the committee wants us to do that research and make that determination, we can we can certainly look into that. Okay, and and uh, question for code enforcement. We talked about um, there was a statement there if if we did away with STRs in certain districts or we were to regulate those in certain other districts, code would have to be involved regardless. So. My question would be if there is a uh, if if there's a party going on at 8 p.m. Somebody's rented out the entire house. The block is filled up with cars. Is that a code enforcement or is that the police? Whether it's 8 p.m., whether it's Saturday, whether it's Sunday, whether it's 1 a.m., um, how does how does that work with code enforcement? Uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, is that is that with things as they currently are, or if we adopted um, proposed registration regulations? Uh, yes. <laughs> Both sides of that coin, please. Okay, so a couple different things. Um, so noise at residential, you know, party music and that kind of thing, um, as well as parking on the street is not something that code compliance handles currently. Um, parking on the street, um, congestion, and as well as residential, uh, parties and noise and disturbance of the peace is in the purview of Dallas Police Department. Um, some of the registration regulations that we have that are currently proposed and are awaiting um, uh, the, the direction from um, from City Council, uh, depending on how the zoning goes. Uh, if we were uh, one of the things we did propose was um, some uh, a noise regulation that code and code compliance could enforce um, on at a short term rental property um, that was registered. So if they were registered, then we could hold them to the um, to the requirement of, you know, I, I think that what was proposed was there could be no music uh, or no um, sound that could be he heard from a speaker beyond the property line. So something like that could be used. Uh, we could also go a, di a different um, direction that was discussed, um, but not preferred as of this point, which is a decibel reading uh, level coming from the property. Okay, so for the noise reg, if it was 1 a.m., are, are you going to go out, would code, would someone call code to come out at 1 a.m. and make that measurement? So th those are operational considerations that also kind of depend on the direction um, that everything goes. One of the pro proposals is um, if, if we had a full-blown registration program, we've already done a fee study to determine um, the cost of the registration in order to have a program um, of inspectors, both in the daytime and at nighttime. 
So, so if, if we do choose to go the regulation um, route where, where you know, so many people have to, have to register, uh, then, then there is a potential for us to have a, um, a team at night to be able to respond to some of the regulations that we put forth. Okay, and this, I, this might be a question for the city attorney. Uh, is Ms. Mr. Burgess there? Uh, Casey Burgess had to step out, but um, my name is Laura Morrison, and I'm here. Hello, Ms. Morrison. Long Hi. time no talk to you. Um, qu question for you. So, if if we did away with STRs in residential um, districts and and uh, single single family multifamily townhouse districts, and there was an um, an illegal operation at that point, um, and it, it was recurring. What are the tools that you and the, the city attorney's office could use to, to shut that down if it was an e a completely illegal operation? Um, well, that's something we would look into. We'd probably involve our community prosecution team uh, to go out and issue notices of violation for violating the land use regulations, and then we would start issuing citations. And then there are further steps that community prosecution can use uh, civilly um, to bring anyone um, to court um, to seek remedies for a continued illegal use. Okay, so you're saying you, you could basically take them to court or do citations based on the land use, illegal land use, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so now the flip side of that question, say we do allow them in residential districts, so it is a legal land use, um, I would assume then your tool to go after them with an illegal land use is now taken out of your toolkit. Is that correct? Um, yes and no. Um, even a legal land use that's operating in the a locate a zoning location where it's allowed would still have to comply with all of the regulations that govern that land use. So there could be a possibility that even a legal land use. Um, isn't fully in compliance with all the provisions that they need to comply with in the Dallas Development Code. Um, so there could be issues even with a land use that's legal in the zoning district where it's operating if they're not complying with all provisions that they need to comply with. Okay. It's not as cut and dry, but it could be done. Right. If you're operating legally where you're allowed to operate in the zoning district where you're allowed to operate and you're complying with all um, city uh, codes and regulations and with all state and federal laws, then you're good. But you still, the, you know, there are provisions that you'd still have to comply with while okay. you're operating right. your legal land use. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think Commissioner Blair has questions. I also wanted to acknowledge that Commissioner Standard is with us today. Um, I want to go back to the PDs that are existing and then those to, to going forward. I and, and make sure, I want to make sure I understood you correctly that there's 900, correct? And that the discussion before was that the, that the consideration of opening up our PD to read it and, and administer it is arduous at best it it it's not impossible i have actually i have actually looked into every single pd um, when i first came on to the city to see is a residential use allowed or not allowed in this pd all 1000 and you know, 1100 of them so it's not impossible it has of course been done um but basically to know the effect of a base zoning change on a PD, you have to go in and look at the PD. So if we were to say we're going to move this forward with allowing STRs in residential and, and, and standard zoning R, whatever size R it is, um, then we would be, we could conceivably be opening the door that says that every existing PD that has a base zone of, res of single family, and if, and if we are, uh, for that matter, if we're looking at town, I mean at a multifamily, we would have to look at both of them, correct? That is correct. That's essentially the, 
the flip side of the same coin as if you prohibit in, in all the R districts or allow, you're doing the same, either way, we don't know the effect of, of that regulation on a particular PD until we look at the PD. Then moving forward, any PDs that are written that have any kind of residential um, zoning, whether it be multifamily and or single family, as a commissioner, I would it would behoove the body, the seat, the, the commission, to a, make an, a, an addressing if STRs were to be allowed, how they would be operating within that PD. So I think um, I think once the decision is made on what what list of zoning districts short-term rentals are allowable in. Once that decision is made, that then is part of the commission's calculus in examining new PD proposals to say, um, well, they're asking, just like you do now. So um, if a PD comes before you and they're asking for a base of MF2A, um, the commission looks, staff and commission and council looks at the list of uses that are allowed in MF2A and determines if they feel that that list of uses is appropriate or not for that specific particular location, um, along with the set of development standards that the PD proposes and the, um, you know, all of those different little provisions that get put into a PD because, um, because this area needs its own particular set of rules. Um, that's already part of your, your math that you do. It's just a matter of folding in, well, hey, now there's this new use, short-term rental lodging, that is allowed in this set of districts maybe that changes, um, you know, if I was reviewing this yesterday before short-term rental lodging was allowed in this set of, in this zoning district, my math would be different, but now it is allowed, and so now I have to think, change how I'm thinking about this particular PD um, as I review it. Um, but that, you're already doing that, the commission's already doing that with every other use chart that comes before them with every PD. So I think it just gets folded in, but it is, of course, like every use, it's, it's important to, to consider that as part of the whole um, development project that the PD is essentially proposing. Just one more question on PDs and then I wanna go to code. Um, I'm coming. <laughs> so with, with PDs and um, if, we, if we say, okay, we're going to allow STRs and STR and we are going to reopen every PD to that has a base zoning of residential, whether it's multifamily or single family, then because each PD is managed, it's its own separate ordinance, would that mean that the body would have to go through a process to go back to the, the, oh, the developer owner of, of that particular PD and have them come up to a consensus as to how they want STRs managed within their PD. So I think that what would happen would be, um, let's say for example, um, the, the city council decides to prohibit short-term rentals in R7.5. And I am a developer and I have a PD that is based on R7.5 um, with no changes to use. So now all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, after two or three years of, of deliberation and open discussion, um, city council has said, you know what, short-term rentals are not allowed. I have a few that I as a developer have retained ownership of and I'm operating. Okay, I've got to shut those down. They're not allowed. But I want to keep on doing them. Um, if I wanted to go in and, and amend my PD zoning to allow them, I would have to come before the commission and the council and, and make that request. If city council, city plan commission wanted to proactively go in and open every single PD, they could do that. Um, that's in their purview through the authorization and the authorized hearing uh, process. Um, in terms of mechanics, can we do all of those at once? Could, I, could we write a memo saying, let's open up every PD in the city and, and look at them for short-term rentals? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but I'm the one who has to read that in the record, so you know, let's think about that a little bit for my for my sake. Um, I'll bring a bottle of water with me. But there are, um, you know, the mechanics of that are. Um, I don't know the answer, but 
Could it be done? Yes. Um, could it be done either way? Yes. And could an owner in any particular of any particular piece of land in the city come before the city plan commission and council with a request to amend their zoning? Absolutely, um, as they can today. Um, and you know, does it kind of? We don't know where we're going to land yet, based on our discussions, um, but. That's kind of the nature of the PD is that we don't know what happens to the PD until we read the PD, until the base, dis base zoning is changed, and then we can look at the PD and say, well, what are the effects? Um, and I, as I mentioned before, I've personally done it before, gone through every single PD. Um, more than happy to do it again, and we can, if we want a full accounting of what would happen to each PD, um, we, we can do that. I can't promise you that I'll have it done in two weeks uh, for our next meeting, but um, it can be done. Thank you, um, Cole. And I'm going to be really, really quick, hopefully. Um, today, when we look at the opportunities code has to manage existing code issues, and if STRs are allowed, or um, how arduous would it be and how do you know off the, the top if they're if they are registered STRs how much more staff would be required in order to manage that thank you for the question so um, it, it we can't tell for certain what would happen in the future, um, but with the numbers that we have and with, like, like I mentioned, the fee study that we already went through, what would it take to manage the program? Um, our staffing looks like um, a supervisor, a couple of administrative assistants to handle the um, your registration process. Um, if we move forward with an initial inspection required at registration and then have regulations for us to enforce at night, our current um, estimation is seven code officers for the daytime. Um, and seven code officers for the nighttime. So for those that, okay, so that would be for registered um, STRs. If we have those that are non-registered, so illegal, um, would your staff would then still go out on that or would that be a, a police issue uh, at this point i wouldn't anticipate it be a police issue uh, it still comes down to the to the determination of whether or not we build out a whole registration program or whether we prohibit them across the board uh, depending on which which direction the zoning goes if, if we have a register a registration program that allows us to have um, the, the funding is in place via the via the fee for the registration for those 14 code officers. Um, they would ostensibly be able to, um, to they, they'd be out in the field daytime or nighttime to be able to address um, illegal operations as well. Now, if we don't if we don't have if, if we do not move forward with adding staff for this purpose with this funding, that's just going to be a, a question for city council um, or for code compliance to determine how then can we take on an, an, a, a new um, operation that we've determined is prohibited and whether that's going to require additional staff or not we'd have to look into that so that just to make it really simple you know for me if we allow it then we have to um, address the the staffing for those for those that are legal as well as illegal if if it becomes a code issue correct yes ma'am Commissioner Blair, do we still have someone with the city attorney's office? Oh, pardon me. I'm going to let Mr. Hall, and then I'll come back. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Mr. Hall. Thank you. Just a couple of quick questions. One, from my understanding, when you say R7.5, <clears throat> that refers to a lot that's 7,500 square feet. So the, the requirement in, if you're anywhere in an R 7.5A district, the minimum lot size is 7,500 square feet, but it can be larger. It could be. Yes. And uh, R 10 would be minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet. So That's correct. Okay. Second question, if, if you were to uh, define short-term rental as lodging use and allow them in R, does that open R to other lodging uses? 
No. No. No, because the, the placing something in section 4.205 lodging uses is a organization strategy for the code. It's not, that is not the list of uses. So what essentially the, the, the Bible of is the use allowed or not is the list of districts. You go to your district regulations, 4.205, here's a use, short-term rental lodging, and it's gonna have a list that's gonna say, this use is allowed by right in these districts. Um, calling it a lodging use by itself really doesn't do anything except put it in that section of code, but that list of uses of, of districts where it's allowed can be anything. Um, so the way I see it is it's purely a, an organization method by calling it lodging uses. Um, now there are some PDs that, and again, I don't know if this PD exists, but you could write a PD that says all uses that are in the lodging use section of code 4.205 are allowed in this PD and then stop talking. And then yes, in that PD, all lodging uses, hotel, motel, boarding house, uh, general purpose overnight shelter, extended stay hotel, motel, and potentially short-term rental lodging would all be allowed in that PD. But um, there's not, you know, there's nowhere in the code that says, hey, in an R7.5A district, um, you know, lodging uses as a whole are disallowed. It's the other way around. It says, hey, I have this use of single family residential. Um, it is allowed in an R7.5 district. It is, and if it's, if I don't say it's allowed in this district, it's not allowed in that district. So um, really the, 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 the point of the code, the part of the code where we say yes or no, it's allowed or not, is actually in the use section where I have a list of districts where this use is allowed, not the other way around where I have a district and here's a list of uses that are allowed, which is a really the same two sides of the same coin, but um, again, that, that lodging use designation is really just organization. Um, it's a way to, to put it in a section of the code that makes sense with other similar uses, but calling it that by itself doesn't actually do anything. The district, the list of allowed districts that we put in that paragraph is what's important. So short answer is no. Thank you. Much longer answer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Baring, and I'm gonna say this is our, our last round, please. Mr. Baring. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions regarding the uh, owner occupancy research, I, I suppose for Mr. Doss, maybe for code compliance. For the cities uh, such as San Antonio, LA, and Denver that have made the distinction for owner occupied, are they effectively not than handling this through zoning, they're handling this through registration, and how, and if so, how are the non-owner occupied being regulated? Thank you. Sure. So the um, if if the city enlists, so basically the other cities that we studied, um, other than these three, um, and I'm I'm ignoring New Orleans because they have a very 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 well developed, nuanced. Um, way of managing STRs that is, um, I think, unique to New Orleans because of the, the, the place that New Orleans is. So I'm ignoring New Orleans, but the other cities um, really don't differentiate. So San Antonio, I mean, we know about Austin and, and their kind of challenges. So I wanted to focus on, um, on these three cities. So the, the way that San Antonio manages it is it is in their zoning. They, they call an owner-occupied short-term rental in their zoning code as a type one and a non-owner-occupied as type two. And the only difference in standard for those type one and type two is the applicability of the density limit, the 12.5% for a block face or 12.5% of a building. Um, Los Angeles and Denver don't specifically say owner occupied or non owner occupied. They designate short term rental, um, or in Los Angeles's case, they, they call it home sharing, but in Denver, they call it short term rental, but they say, um, they, they don't actually specifically say owner occupied or non, they say it's accessory, it's an accessory use to a residential use, um, which takes the ownership piece really out because they allow a, a tenant to operate the use, um, but either way there's still a requirement that 
the residence be used as a permanent residence by someone, by, by a long-term tenant, by an owner, um, and then that person is then the operator. Um, it's not necessarily the institution that owns the home or the landlord, it is the, the actual person who lives in the unit um, is the one operating. Um, and so in Los Angeles and Denver, that is the only way to operate a short-term rental. Okay, so, and I believe this distinction is very important, the owner-occupied, non-owner-occupied. It sounds like then we could, uh, would we go in that direction? We could craft something that is chapter 51, a zoning solution, such as, uh, I believe you said San Antonio, um, or, or we could, or we could not. So it could still be a zoning solution. That is that is correct. The um, San Antonio, their their owner occupied, non owner occupied um, determination is a, is in the zoning reg. Los Angeles is a little weird because their city planning department is also their license business licensing department. So they kind of lump everything all into one, and all of their home sharing regs are in chapter 32, which is a subchapter of something called exceptions. Um, I don't know what it's an exception to, um, so I don't know if it is a, a zoning, a registration. It's kind of all of the above, um, because again, the same department does all of it. And in Denver, um, if my memory does not fail me, um, the only zoning piece for the Denver um, regulation is uh, that there is no like size limit on the short-term rental, but that the, that the, if there are two dwelling units on the property, the primary dwelling unit has to be the one that is occupied by the resident. Um, so basically if I own, if I have a home and a, and a accessory dwelling unit or a, a garage apartment, um, I can't live in the garage department and use my main home as a short-term rental. I have to live in the main house. Um, and I think that is in the Denver zoning um, piece, but it's a very, very small portion. The rest of their regs are in a registration licensing um, section. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bearing. Um, if I can ask one follow-up, perhaps for the city attorney on that, on the owner-occupied question, and I'll direct it to Ms. Morrison or Mr. King. Um, I think it was noted that there wasn't a conflict identified in state law, but since we have an understanding now that corporations can be potentially considered as a person, how does that impact owner occupancy? That is um, not something I've discussed with Mr. Burgess. I'm not sure if he's done some research into that. That's something I would want to talk to him about first, but that, that's a good question. Uh, let me talk to him and then uh, we'll get you all an answer. Thank you. And um, one final question. We received um, some communications yesterday that included um, something that was uh, suggesting a mixed living community. Is that anything that staff has evaluated? Not at this point, no. Thank you, Mr. Doss. And with that, any final questions before we move to, yes, Mr. McGregor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Doss, at prior meetings, we talked about um, the city collaborating with the platform companies for an, in a number of ways to help collect uh, tax um, and also to manage, like re review 311, stats to manage bad performers. Um, how, how would or can we, through the code, hold uh, the platforms accountable? And can we uh, design penalties if they don't uh, fulfill or, or, or basically uh, do their job? So in terms of, of the land use code, I'm, I'm really not sure um, if but I think it's probably more of a registration and licensing um, side of thing, um, you know, because it deals with the listing. It doesn't necessarily deal with the land and, you know, whether or not we require that a, um, a vendor or that a, um, that a listing agency, you know, uh, enroll with our vendor for the purposes of remitting the tax and here's the penalty if you don't. 
not really a land use discussion um, based on my understanding of it, but I think that, um, I don't know if Jeremy, if you had anything to add. So it, it's been discussed, but I, I would defer to city attorney's office on, on what we can do specifically. Uh, I'm sorry, can you say that again? I, didn't. Well, I, I would just say I would defer to the city attorney's office on what we can specifically okay. regulate. So if we're talking violations of the Dallas Development Code, those would be land use based violations. Uh, those violations are punishable of a fine up to $2,000. The state allows us um, to assess fines for up to $2,000. Um, if it's more a violation of the registration, which would be located somewhere else um, in the Dallas City Code, um, those offenses are punishable of a fine up to $500. And it's per offense. So um, especially you know, with a zoning violation, you know, if you violate it one day, you could get a citation that day, and if you're still in violation the next day, that could be a, possibly another uh, citation, so they could rack up over time. Thank you. Uh, may I ask that uh, staff put on their to-do list a uh, look into how other cities have managed uh, this issue? Because I, I know it has been implemented in, in, in some other cities. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. So I'm gonna suggest that we take a brief five minute recess uh, for all members and then we will begin our public speakers. For those who are online, uh, our staff will begin moving you over to the participant list. We will go through our registered speakers in the order that they're received and then take any other members of the public uh, that are here in person as our time allows. So we will be back in five minutes at 1117, thank you. We are recording. Thank you, Mr. King. And we see our members. Thank you. So thank you to all of our speakers. Um, bear with me one moment. Okay, we're going to uh, begin with our registered speaker list. Each speaker will have one minute um, as a reminder, please begin with your name and address and those appearing virtually again, your camera must be on in order for us to hear from you today. We're going to begin with our carryover speakers from our July 7th meeting. Our first speaker is Hector Escalante. Hi, um, my name is Hector Escalante. I reside at 1911 Lansford Avenue in District 1. My once quiet neighborhood has been disrupted by inconsiderate guests who stay at an STR next door to me. The new owners of the property listed the home on Airbnb because they can make more money renting it out nightly than by letting a family live there. They live in South Lake and do not care about the safety and serenity of my family. The city's controller's office confirms they are not registered and are not paying taxes to the city. They even told me that the property was not listed on STR platform, yet I was easily able to find it on Airbnb. I knew from per personal experience that it was being operated as a motel. I have seen constant stream of strangers who stay there and make loud noise in the backyard. My family lives in fear over what danger lurks next with the next guest. We are tired of being kept up all hours. Of the night. Mr. Escalante, Thank could you. you finish your thought, please? Yeah, and um, and they're not paying hot taxes, and uh, we've had numerous complaints, and um, uh, we're sick and tired of it, simply. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Carol Considine. Mr. King, is Ms. Considine online? Not online. All right, next speaker, Alan Hernandez. Alan Hernandez? Not online. Next speaker, Cookie Peden. Okay. 
Is the mic on? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Cookie Peden, 7111 Debbie Drive, Dallas, 75252. Thanks to all of you who've spent so much time on this topic. And I think finally we're reaching the point where it comes down to a very simple solution. States already defined an STR as a commercial, uh, a commercial, <laughs> losing my thought, commercial lodging use. And as such, they're collecting hotel taxes. I think the city needs to be consistent with what the state has already stated, and that is this is a commercial lodging use. As such, it should not be allowed in residential neighborhoods. Zoning exists in order to separate residential homes from commercial, industrial, and other types of operations. Those operations are inconsistent and intrusive in a family-oriented neighborhood. If you make an exception or establish a precedent by allowing those operations, then basically you've opened a can of worms so that there could be other things done. Can you complete your thought, please? Yes. I urge you not to make the same mistakes we've seen the city of Dallas do before. Don't allow another shingle mountain in your backyard or a battery facility next door to a school. Thank you for being with us today. Krista Allen. Krista Allen. Not online. And not present. Uh, next speaker, Aiden. I'll have a first name only. Aiden. Not online. Next speaker, Lauren Winkler. Good morning. Ms. Winkler, can you hear us? Ms. Winkler is not present. Is she online? Not online. Rob Stokes, followed by Carolyn Barnett. Rob Stokes. Hi, my name is Rob Stokes, and I live at Forest Home Briar Court. Sir, we can hear you, but we can't see you. you can't okay, we can see you now. Thank you. Okay, I'm Rob Stokes, and I live at Forest Home Briar Court in the Lowest Greenville area of Dallas. I have paid over seven hundred dollars in hotel tax this year, and that's on top of my eighty-seven hundred dollars in taxes for the year, property taxes. I have single. Uh, I mean, my guests have single-handedly kept Greenville Avenue pizza in business. You should, you'd be amazed at all the pizza boxes I remove upon, remove from their rooms upon checkout. And then all the proceeds from the rest of my guests get, get split between HG Supply, Libertine, Seven Mediterranean Cafe, and all those others here on Lower Greenville. Many of my guests have come to my Airbnb just to learn the neighborhood. At least four have stayed in the Lower Greenville area of Dallas. One such couple moved here from Tel Aviv nine months ago. I met with them a month ago, and they now employ 20 people in the South Dallas area. I hope you will keep STRs in the residential area so that people can experience our great neighborhoods and maybe even choose to live here. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Carolyn Barnett, followed by Ray Olvera. Carolyn Barnett. Good morning, can you see me? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Carol Barnett and I live at 3617 Golden Hills Drive in Dallas, Texas in District 8. I'm here today standing with the 50 other residents in my community who signed a petition and it is currently in the office of our Councilman Tanel Atkins. We all have a common concern and the concern is primarily safety. Safety is a big, big issue in our community, and we've worked with DPD to establish relationships among the residents in our area so that we can work together to have a safe community. With the existence of STRs, we are not able to uh, have that relationship with the transit uh, guests that are in those properties, and we're uh, feeling that it is not safe for us, along even with some of the incidents that we've seen with the uh, guests that have occurred, it's not safe for them. But our main concern is the location of the STRs 
because we're not able to, they're located within a thousand feet of a school, church, park, and a daycare center. And it's not able to, to fully execute the regulations and so forth they are required to. Ms. Barnett, if you could please finish your thought, that was your time. Okay, we just want to be able to access the kids, uh, ask you to have the kids uh, adopt the kids uh, resolution because we need to have safety enforcement in our communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us today. Ray Olvera, followed by Michael Brown. Ray Olvera, not present. Is Mr. Olvera online? Not online. Michael Brown, followed by Sharaka Damar. Dharma, excuse me. Michael Brown, not present. I have a mic online. I'm going to move over just in case um, with no last name listed. So we'll try him. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Michael Brown and Sharaka Dharma. Sharaka Dharma is not online. Okay. And I don't think that mic is the Michael Brown. Okay. Michael Brown, not present. So our registered speakers list for today, John Goodman, followed by Matthew Bach. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to echo the <clears throat> thanks that was given before. Thank you very much for your time and attention to this matter. Cities all across America are wrestling they're wrestling with STRs. Most are in the process of deciding what matters the most, their citizens and the health of their city or an illegal land use. Failure to clarify our zoning ordinance today could obviously limit the options Dallas has down the road. Take a look at the mess Austin has created. We're here today to remind everyone that property owners in Dallas have rights. One important right is the one they were granted when they bought their house. They were granted the right, the zoning right, that prevents commercial lodging operations in residential neighborhoods. And that's fundamental. That's a fundamental right. Regulation cannot control the root problems of STRs in residential zones, at least not from what I've witnessed and, res and read about. It won't fix the loss of security. It won't fix the loss of safety. It won't fix the loss of income to our schools. It won't fix the negative impact. Mr. Goodman, that's your time. On available housing and regulation will never fix the serious negative impact to the Thank city of Dallas. Thank you for Dallas. being with us today. Matthew Bach, followed by Elizabeth Lukemeyer. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Matt Bach. I live at 15746. Covewood Circle, Dallas, Texas, um, and I support the keep it simple solution for short term rentals. Short term rentals are hotels. That's straightforward enough. Please uphold the current code, which prohibits hotels and lodging uses in residential zoning. You know, we bought our homes uh, at 15746 Covewood, delivering it to people we know and trust, neighbors who step up and help when we need a helping hand. And we are blessed to live in a wonderfully tight knit neighborhood. But as president of my own association, I've experienced firsthand the problems transient renters and offsite landlords pose to neighborhoods. You know, limiting STRs isn't a case of trying to balance two competing legitimate interests. STRs are owned primarily by investors who simply want to make money. They have no long term stake in our neighborhoods or city. STRs do nothing to improve a neighborhood. In fact, STRs hollow out a neighborhood, causing significant harm. Mr. Bach, Healthy, that's your time. Strong. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us today. Elizabeth Lukemeyer, followed by Ashley Travis. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Lukemeyer, and I currently reside at 6311 Annapolis Drive in Dallas. And I have been a resident of Dallas for over 16 years. 
earlier this year, my husband and I made the decision to sell our home because a new owner in the home behind us became a nuisance. We wanted to stay in the same area of Dallas where we're living and purchase a new home where we could raise our family. We were not going to repeat our experience of living next to a nuisance property. Interestingly, we never saw a single home listing that boasted of an STR hotel next door as a selling feature. Let's face it, nobody wants to have their largest investment, which is their home next door to an unregulated hotel. We did find a neighborhood that we believe that our criteria for safety, community, and schools in Dallas currently without STRs nearby. But given the growth rate of STRs in the city, I needed to act quickly and support the KISS solution to keep STRs out of my new residential neighborhood, please. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Ashley Travis, followed by Anita Savage. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. My name is Ashley Travis and I live at 7717 La Bolsa Drive. Like many of my neighbors, I've lived in Dallas for over 50 years. I attended public schools here and my current home is in District 12. People move to our Dallas neighborhoods because they want what we have. They want a warm, welcoming sense of community and they want good public schools. But we're in crisis. We're in danger of losing the very things that are attracting families, especially young families, to Dallas. The growing number of STRs and corporate investors are now blocking the regeneration of our neighborhoods. Unlike Frisco, Forney, Salina, and other fast growth North Texas cities, Dallas doesn't have any more fields to build homes on. What we have is our neighborhoods. The, the result of the decay that, that comes with STRs being purchased is families moving farther out into the suburbs and leaving Dallas. We can all agree this isn't what we want for our city. The citizens of Dallas have placed their trust in you. At your time. Please support the Keep, keep It Simple solution. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you for being with us today. Anita Savage, followed by Vera Elkins. <clears throat> Good morning, I'm Anita Savage and my address is 6115 Prospect Avenue. When I went online and saw the DallasCityHall.com comptroller's office explaining what the hot tax is, the very first sentence says, the Dallas City Code and the state of Texas define a short-term rental as a hotel. When I look at the Zoning 101 um, PowerPoint on our city's website. The first line is zoning is a way municipalities can manage the use of which individual properties may be used. The solution is simple and the mechanism is already in place. Existing zoning prohibits hotels and motels in residential neighborhoods. Keep Dallas housing available for its residents, not for transients. For every house that someone is using, as a short-term rental, we're losing a house for a family. When STRs are defined as a hotel by the, um, are defined as a hotel by the city of Dallas and the state of Texas. Ms. Savage, that's your time. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Vera Elkins followed by Cindy Helstrom. All right, good morning. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for listening. Um, I'm a neighbor, uh, a Dallas resident. I'm also a short-term rental host. Um, per the city report that y'all have issued out is uh, that report said that short-term rentals have no negative effect on the city. And that was from the city of Dallas. Uh, the city has asked me and asked us uh, to register. We did. You asked us to pay hotel tax. We did. Uh, to, you asked us to provide solutions. We did. I am all for fair regulations, but zoning is not the prop, proper route to handle this situation. Uh, a zoning ordinance and the KISS program uh, would violate my property rights and the property rights of many other owners. So we too have property rights, and I do appreciate you listening to us. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. Cindy Helstern, followed by Ms. Helstern, thank you for being with us. 
Thank you. Good morning. I'm Cindy Helstern. I live at 10827 Crooked Creek Drive in Dallas. I'm a 70-year resident of Dallas. I've lived in District 13 all my life. As a Neighborhood Association board member and block leader for over 30 years, uh, in the last two weeks, more than a dozen residents have reached out to me to try to find out how to accurately get access to 311 and 911. They are so distressed. This is not becoming unusual. This is happening between each meeting. I'm getting at least 12 people reaching out to me. How can we handle this? We're in distress. I think Dallas has reached a tipping point. It reminds me as myself as a child at Niagara Falls, standing on the edge, watching everything go over the edge, rushing down a river. I see the warning sign, act now, provide the city responders with funding, zoning, and tandem regulations to levy the current. My two adult, your time, Ms. thank you so much. Thank you for being Please, with us uh, today. Please support the KISS solution. Jolyn Nugent, followed by Benjamin Nugent. Jolyn Nugent, not present. Not online. Benjamin Nugent. Not online. Thank you, not present. Olive Talley, followed by Lisa Sievers. Yes, good morning. <clears throat> Olive Tally, 6133 Prospect Avenue. While the spirit of neighborliness was important on the frontier because neighbors were so few, it's even more important now because our neighbors are so many. Those are the words of Lady Bird Johnson. They should resonate today as you decide how to regulate STRs in Dallas. As Lady Bird asked, will your cities be places to thrive in or to escape from? and what places will be left to escape to. Please listen to the neighbors and the residents throughout Dallas who are clamoring to escape the ravages of living near an STR. Protect stable neighborhoods from being hollowed out by investors who chose to cash in and take the risk of opening a lodging business that wasn't allowed in code. Worsening our housing crisis and driving up prices for everyone to put more money in their own pocketbooks. This is a land use issue, issue, pure and simple. Settle it in favor of the 500,000 homeowners who have promised Ms. Talley, to, that's your time. to another neighbor. Otherwise, we will all become a place where we want to escape thank, from. Thank you for thank being you. with us today. Thank you. Lisa Sievers, followed by Martin Siegler. Lisa Sievers, not present. Not online. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, wait, there you are. There you are. Good, good morning, Ms. Siegler. That's Sorry. Lisa Sievers. Sievers, pardon me. Uh, can, is your camera active? We can hear you, but not see you. I'm working on it. It was in this game. I just do it again. I'll take it. <laughs> Ms. Sievers, would you like us to come back to you? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly. Martin Siegler. Thank you. Martin Siegler, 6553 Lake Circle Drive. When I bought my home in Lakewood in 2014, I never dreamed I would be forced to live across the street from a motel. Yet that is exactly what happened since the duplex was leased by its owner to a couple that operates a short-term rental business out of properties that they lease across the city. Since that happened two years ago, we have endured parties, loud music, drug use, drug sales, and even the filming of a movie, including fighting and lights in the middle of the front yard at night. Get the video started. We can't even take our children into this front yard anymore because of concerns for their safety. We have pleaded with the property owner and STR operator, both of which are local. We have called police many times and begged our city councilwoman to do something to stop this madness. Despite our pleas, nothing has changed. I should be able to live in peace in my home without an illicit motel operating across the street, all because of a zoning loophole. This situation cannot be fixed by regulation and enforcement. Zoning is the only answer. Single family neighborhoods are for exactly that, families, not businesses nor motels. 
Members of the ZOAC, I implore you to help citizens Mr. Like Siegler, to adopt that's your time. this solution. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Ms. Sievers, I believe we saw you, but you're no longer on our screen. Are you able to unmute yourself? Can you see me now? We can hear you. We saw you for a moment. Okay. I'm still working on it. Okay, we'll come back. Timothy Siegler. Hello. My Good morning. Timothy Sigler. I live at 6553 Lake Circle Drive in Dallas, Texas. I live in the East Dallas neighborhood of Lakewood, and we have a double STR duplex across the street from us. I support the KISS solution. Please ban all short-term rentals in single-family neighborhoods like mine. I have heard a lot about regulations, staffing requirements, and how to serve out-of-state owners and operators. What I really hear is you'll never have enough money and people to properly enforce any of these regulations in, in all of the si single family resident zones across the city. Please keep it simple. Ban all STRs in single family neighborhoods. What I'm not hearing from pro STR people talk about is neighborhood stability, crime, nuisance, and housing shortages. STRs only belong in mixed use areas of the city like Uptown, Downtown, and Deep Ellum. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Jack Cox, followed by Tom Forsyth, then John James. Jack Cox, Cox. Not online. Not present, Tom Forsyth. Thank you. My name is Tom Forsyth. I live at 2115 Siesta Drive in District 4, and I ask you to, to support the KISS Solution Zoning Amendment that is before you. It is entirely appropriate for you to apply SDRs to the definition of, uh, to the land use category to which they are most similar, which is clearly lodging. Dallas homeowners purchase their homes with the confidence instilled in them by our zoning laws that they would not have to live next door to a hotel or a commercial business. SDRs clearly apply to both. Allowing SDRs to operate in residential zones is a mockery of our zoning laws and it shows hypocrisy since the city happily collects the hot tax from them. But worse, it shows a lack of respect for the property rights of homeowners in the Dallas, city of Dallas. You must truly ha have lived next door to an SDR to understand the magnitude of the problems they cause. Please be open to the pleas you hear from the homeowners who contend with the nuisance and the disruption that they bring Mr. to their Forsyth, daily existence. That's your time. Thank, Thank you. you for being with us. John James, followed by Jackie Burst. Burks, excuse me. Hi, good morning. This is John Hyman, 3220 Lakey. As a Dallas homeowner and national business owner, I'm worried Dallas is facing a grim future of STRs are allowed next to homeowners. You may associate STRs with 50 plus loud guests, but can you imagine living next to one with 50 plus eerily quiet guests, shades drawn, armed bouncers at the door? From my experience, STRs can use a pop up commercial anything, legal and illegal. Our children should grow up next to neighbors, not customers. I'm actively trying to recruit employees and young homeowners to move to Dallas and work in my uptown office space. When they ask me if Dallas neighborhoods are safe and if there's a possibility they might have to be next to an STR, they've heard so much about, what do I say? 500,000 Dallas homeowners do not want their neighborhoods and homes and values eroded because they are next to STRs. STRs will depress property values, which will be a far greater loss of tax revenue for the city than tax collected from STRs. Homeowners want to live next to homeowners. Not even STR owners want to be next to an STRs. You can vote to protect 500,000 homeowners that are against STRs, or you can vote in favor of STR owners who are pushing up homeowners out. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Please, no displays. Thank you. Jackie Burke, and is Ms. Sievers able to get our camera operational? Sarah online a minute ago. All right, we'll come back. Jackie Burks, followed by Rob Thomas. Good morning, my name is Jackie Burks. I'm a realtor with Berkshire Burks, Hathaway. We, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay, hang on here. 
Okay, can you see me now? Yes, ma'am, please continue. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Jackie Burks. I'm a realtor with Berkshire Hathaway and I'm a home homeowner at 8240 Stony Creek Drive in the Claremont subdivision in East Dallas. Uh, there are at least 16 STRs within a half mile of my home. Currently, I have one, two doors down one direction and two doors down the other direction from me. So I can speak from my personal experience as far as what you know about the, the noise, the congestion of parking on streets. One of the homes has a pool, so they not only entertain the number of guests allowed probably at that home, but on the weekend, I'll just see carloads of people showing up. Um, in my neighborhood, there are many homes that advertise that they are four to five bedroom homes that they can sleep anywhere from 16 to 20 people. That would never be allowed with a long-term rental. Um, the way I see it, they're just not being regulated, as you know, and as a viewpoint from a realtor, uh, HOAs in many communities do not allow STRs for the obvious reasons. Uh, one being it affects the property values. Um, as an agent, competition- you Catch know, your time, Ms. Parks. Right, you know, competition uh, as far as purchasing, long-term lease so rentals are not available. I ask you to please listen uh, and not for turn our single us. family neighborhoods into commercial use. Thank Just you for being with us. Rob Thomas, community. followed by Dolores Soroka. Rob Thomas, not present. Is Mr. Thomas online? Thomas is not not online now. Thank you. Dolores Sorka. Good morning. Soroka. Good morning. Uh, my apologies. That's okay. My name is Dolores Levy Soroka. I reside in the Peak Suburban Edition Historic District in Dallas at 4822 Swiss Avenue since 1976. Um, interestingly enough, I was in the hospitality industry, corporate development, and reservation systems for Hilton Hotels. So I understand hotels and I understand the need for guests in hotels. But I am asking that Dallas enforce existing zoning and adopt the KISS solution, which obviously defines short-term rentals as lodging. They're guests, they're not residents. Uh, I, you know, I have to say that I, I, I'm not sure I would have had a dog in this fight except that I recently sold a duplex next to me that I owned for almost 20 years. and. I purposely wanted someone that would live in the duplex and be part of the neighborhood and, you know, would make some income from renting the um, upstairs unit in the garage apartment. But it turns out that individual misrepresented themselves and I now have to deal with an STR, probably not the only one in the neighborhood. So please adopt the KISS solution. Zoning is zoning and we need to maintain residential zoning. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Matthew Curtis, followed by Victor C. and Ruth Banda Batista. Matthew Curtis. Good morning. Hi, good morning. I'm Matt Curtis. I'm from Austin, Texas. Um, and I have been working on short term rental policies for about 12 years. I've been out uh, working with the out working with a consultancy for the last six years that I started on my own with a few other former policymakers and former government staff members. Now the discussion as you guys are going through it right now actually bans traditional corporate apartments. So the model of corporate apartments, if you discussed having six units in a 60 uh, unit building, that would not allow the traditional corporate apartment model. So as you go through this, make sure to understand those different models as you're discussing regulations, corporate apartments, the new flex apartment model, professionally managed models, and commercial mixed-use multifamily central business district zones. All of the comments at the meeting and the last meeting were 100% on single-family residential zones. So these other zones that cater to the professional business traveler and medical stays as well, those types of traditional uh, corporate apartments and flex apartments depend on and help drive the economy for the city of Dallas. So make sure to understand those different models as you go through this discussion before That's accidentally banning that. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Victor C. followed by Ruth Banda Batista. Matthew Curtis not present. 
Oh, excuse me, Victor C. My apologies, Mr. Curtis. Ruth Van Hello. Batiste. Victor? Hi, uh, can you guys Hi. see me? Yeah, yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Victor Chen, uh, 7825 Firefall Way, resident and professional operator of actually the type of flex living and short-term rentals in downtown areas that Matt just talked about. Uh, so from what I've heard, every single commentator speaking against STRs today has talked about STRs being a problem in single family and residentially zoned areas, not commercially zoned downtown areas. And I agree, better regulations are definitely needed in those areas. But it's apparent that very few people here today, if any, consider STRs an actual problem in these commercially zoned downtown areas. Given that, I think the proposed language to restrict units to six in large downtown apartment buildings makes no sense and seems like it was pretty arbitrarily co-opted from Chicago's ordinance, which is a very different city than Dallas and other Texan cities. Why create language around a problem that doesn't exist? My company provides flexible housing to mostly business travelers who stay for a few days or a few weeks. And contrary to much as what was described today, our units are actually literally store to, or in one case, in the same building as a hotel. These types of units should not be treated like hotels. They should be treated like hotels and not subjected to very restrictive and arbitrary language like capping number of units to six units. It doesn't make any common sense. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you, Mr. Chang, for being with us. Ruth Banda Batista, followed by Joseph Percywell. Ruth Banda Batista, not present. Not online. Lisa, Lisa Sievers is on video now. Yes, ma'am, we see you. If you can please begin with your name and address. So we can see you and not hear you. Did you hit the mute button? We can't hear you yet, no. How about now? We can hear you. Yay, can't see you. finally. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Lisa Sievers. My husband and I own and operate two short-term rentals. 90% of all short-term rentals have zero 311 or 911 calls. STRs currently have limited measurable impact on neighboring communities and no evidence of a citywide impact. 0.42% of the city's total residences are STRs. These are facts from the city of Dallas staff study completed at the request of city council, May, 2021. The city council already has a solid ordinance proposal with enforcement teeth, including fines and a three strikes program funded by the STR owner fees that would effectively eliminate a few bad operators and allow the rest of us to continue to operate. Why do we want to zone STRs out of existence when over 90% of them are good operators? Please send this back to city council with a firm directive to pass a pro business pro common sense ordinance. This has no place in zoning. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Joseph Percywell, followed by Erica McKim. Joseph Percywell, not present. Not online. Erica McKim. Hi, I'm Erica McKim, and I reside at 8416 Cadenza Lane. I own and I live in my property that is a single family property and I house, um, I have a STR here. I help, I'm a medically retired veteran and this has allowed me to be able to have income to live in my house. I pay taxes, all the hotel taxes and I help, um, I make a safe environment for me and I make a safe environment for all my neighbors in the neighborhood. Nobody has a problem with my STR and even my other neighbors, um, are very uh, like it because I end up doing all kinds of money that goes into my housing, my gardening, my house. So I have one of the prettiest houses in the neighborhood because I'm able to afford that. Um, I um, also help the economy in the East Dallas, Castellanda area because I'm pushing my people towards there. I have nurses that come for staying. I have people that are moving here 
um, that I help them with different neighborhoods through Dallas, what would be best for their needs and what they would like. So I'm having people come here because it's a safe environment that they have that personal touch with that, Dallas. That's your time. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Sharaka Darbungamante, I believe you were an earlier speaker. Are you with us? Not present? Are they online? Not online. Omar Ruiz, followed by Vernon Lewis. Omar Ruiz, not present? Not online. Vernon Lewis, followed by Alan Christopher. Vernon I'm Lewis. Vernon Lewis, I'm here. Can you hear me? Good morning. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. I'm Vernon Lewis. I live at 8238 Barbary Boulevard in Dallas. I'm a retired teacher. The income from our two short-term rentals supplements my retirement income and enables me to pay my exorbitant property taxes. We've never had a problem with our guests, and I have over 850 superior reviews. We pay our hotel taxes, we do not allow parties, and we're respectful of our neighbors and neighborhood. In fact, many of our neighbors, friends, and family use our short-term rentals. I'd like to remind everyone that we don't and have never needed a zoning solution to address short-term rental issues. What we do need is a good ordinance that sidelines the poor operators while allowing the good operators to continue to provide a valuable community service. I urge you today to send this issue back to the city council without further action, instructing them to handle the few new such properties by enacting a good ordinance. Zoning short-term rentals out of existence is not the solution. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Alan Christopher, followed by Ashley Martson and Kimberly Tor. Alan Christopher, not present. Not online. Ashley Martson. Good morning. My name is Ashley Martson. I live at 5103 Pershing Street in District 14. Uh, I'm an owner and active resident in the neighborhood. Uh, that I host in. I am a tax paying super host and I am a real estate lawyer. I'm wearing all of the hats in this meeting. I also live next to three STRs. I have been one of the fortunate ones that has never had an issue, but I am empathetic to those who do have issues. But these are solvable problems with smart enforced regulations. Zoning amendments are not the answer. Uh, illegal operators will still persist. Smart regulations that are enforced by dedicated staff are the best solution for everyone. This is not a simple solution, much as the opposition would had you believe. And since we all love a great acronym, I would suggest that we keep it Dallas. D, we distinguish between shared homes and whole homes. A, annual inspections. L, have a local contact that can enforce potential issues. It's not just the city's job. L, law abiding. If you're not registered, if you're not paying taxes, if you have repeat complaints, you're out. Ms. Martin, that's your time. Thank you so much for your consideration. I'll email you the last two. Thank you for being with us this morning. Kimberly Tor, followed by Cassandra Elder. I, 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 I. Uh, we, we've got a lot of feedback and we can't see you, Ms. Tor. If you have two devices on, you may need to mute them. Can you see me now? We can, but we've got a lot of feedback. I don't know if you have two devices going. I can't see. I don't know if they can yeah. see. That's much better. If you can begin with your name and address. We can see you and hear you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Toer. I live next, I live at 5122 Milam Street. I live next door to an Airbnb and I have no complaints. My family, when they come to visit, they have a place to stay. That's right next to my home. And the thing that I, I feel that there's just some, there's a few bad Airbnb owners and there just needs to be more regulation. 
I don't think that all Airbnb should be done away with for the few bad apples. I also believe that I don't think that out of state, um, out of state people should be able to come into Dallas and buy up large, you know, large amounts of housing to make money on them. That's how I feel. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. So our next speaker, Aiden, was previously called. Cassandra Elder, followed by Blake Arant. Cassandra Elder. Not present. Is Ms. Elder online? Not online. Blake Arant, followed by Sam Thomas. Blake Arant, not present. Yes, no, Blake is here. Good morning. Good if you'll morning. begin with your name and address, thank you. Yes, Blake Arant, 8718 Autumn Oaks Drive. Zoning out SDRs and single family neighborhoods will kill the SDR market in Dallas and effectively eliminate over 200 million from the Dallas economy. People's habits have changed and they want to stay in the houses. Banning SDRs will not redirect these visitors to Dallas hotels. It will redirect them to forward thinking cities where STRs are supported. According to opponents of STRs, only 25% are paying hot. But these 25% are on track to pay over 2 million in hot this year. The hosting platforms can now collect all these taxes. So that will be $8 million at least. In order to collect 8 million in hot, you must generate 115 million in rents. So combine that is 123 million. Now add in all the money that these guests are gonna spend in food and entertainment, and that's easily 200 million in revenue pumped into that, our economy. That's your time, Mr. Ron. Thank you Can for I finish this last us. sentence? Please? I'm sorry? Can I finish this last sentence? Two seconds. Two seconds. This SDR zoning ban sounds like a really bad financial decision, especially during a recession. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Sam Thomas, followed by Linda Young. Sam Thomas, not present. Is Mr. Thomas online? Not online. Linda Young. I have. Uh, an article about Airbnb banning short, uh, party houses. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. We'll circulate that. Our next speakers after Ms. Young will be David Giacchio, Paige Morales. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, my name is Linda Young. I live at 1632 Rio Vista in District 1. Please keep STRs in residential neighborhoods. I've been a super host, five-star super host since 2017, and I'm registered on muni revs and in compliance with all the rules and paying hot taxes. I was not sent here by Airbnb or any other company. I'm here simply representing my own financial interests. Uh, a couple of things I've heard in the speaking from the opposition. Uh, and the way I've eliminated having parties, which are banned by Airbnb, by the way, um, is I have a three-day minimum rental. And I also would suggest rather than, this Dallas Muni Revs is a cumbersome system. It doesn't, obviously is not working since only a quarter of us are registered. So let Airbnb and VRBO collect the, the hot taxes and then you know who all is registered. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. David Giacchio. Not present. Not online. Paige Morales, followed by Brina Smith. Paige Morales, not present. Not online. Brianna Smith, followed by Azar Tarfik. Tafik, my apologies. Brianna Smith, not present. 
not online. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. Uh, I'm from 13750 Rolling Hills Lane, Dallas, Texas. Uh, I have been a short term. Could you state your name as well, please? Yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Azar Tofik, and I've been resident in Dallas for the last eight years. I am a short term rental host for the last five years. So I've been attending these meetings, and uh, this morning as well, one of the commissioner pointed out the numbers in some meetings are 6,000 rental hosts, and this morning it was around 900 or 1,200. So I'm wondering if the problem statement is defined already that we are trying to solve here with these meetings, number one. Number two, in five years I've seen different regulations come, and I've always abided by it. When I got the letter in mail, I got the properties registered, started paying all the taxes, it's up to date. And if more regulations come in, I believe 90% and all the good operators are willing to abide by that. But just right out eliminating, I think that's unfair in the sense because in the last five years, there hasn't been any issues. And the number three is, I've heard from uh, a lot of our fellow citizens that there are 911 calls which are coming in with complaints. That's your time, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Michael Schmidt, followed by Caleb Pittman and Emil Lepe. Michael Schmidt, not present. Michael Schmidt, are you online? He was online. Okay, we'll come back. Caleb Pittman, not present. Is Mr. Pittman online? Not online. Emil Lippe followed by Naomi. We only have a first name. Emil Lippe not present. Is Mr. Lippe online? No longer online. Naomi not present. Naomi online. Hello. Good morning. If you could please begin with your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Naomi Benitez and I reside at 315 South Cedar Chavez, Dallas, Texas, and 5201. I'm a short term rental host and we take responsible hosting very seriously as a property management company. We want our neighbors to never be disrupted by our guests. I'm a pro short term rental host and also pro regulations. We have hosted many friends and family members of our neighbors. And I encourage the city of Dallas to regulate fairly. Our neighbors, our neighbors want to have their families as neighbors when they come into town and not send them to a hotel. Wait. These are the measures we take as to be responsible. We have very strict house rules and we decline the request of its company. We have weekend minimums. We have quiet hours that start at 9 p.m. We have overnight hours that start at 10 p.m. Only registered guests in the home. We have two visitor limits, only by approval. We have limits on vehicles. 24-hour surveillance. We have noise and device monitors to ensure the noise levels are always respected at our decibel level set and also to track how many guests are in the home. We share our contact information with neighbors, a ground property manager that's available 24-7, whether that's at 9 p.m., 3 in the morning, 5 in the morning, we're there. We have that, that's call. your time. We have never had to call 911. Thank, thank you for being with us. Neighbors, thank you so much. Cindy Diffen, Diffen Durfer followed by Norma Minnis. Cindy Diffendorfer, not present. Not online. And were we able to determine is Michael Schmidt online? No, not online. Thank you. Norma Menace, followed by Bill Morrow and Ed Zahara. Norma Menace, not present. Is Ms. Menace online? No longer online. Mr. Morrow? Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Bill Morrow. I live at 8522 Stable Glen <clears throat> Drive in Dallas. In my 30s, I purchased my home in Lake Highlands. 
Shortly after I purchased my home, the economy went down. Absentee apartment investors in our neighborhood slashed rents, allowed properties to deteriorate, and residential values plummeted and crime soared. Now we have hotel-like properties called short-term rentals, STRs. They too are absentee investors, business owners. 53% do not call Dallas or Texas home, and 68% of these investors have multiple properties. These STR investors ignore, if not the letter of the residential zoning, they certainly ignore the spirit of our residential zoning. These zoning ordinances are designed to protect the quality of life, our property values, and minimize crime. Support the adopt the Kisk solution, and let STRs operate in zones that they're allowed to operate in and not in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Morrow. Ed Zahara, followed by Martha Heimberg. Good morning. Ed Zahara, 1003 Valencia, Dallas, Texas. Support the Keep It Simple solution, council consensus option. STRs have become a popular lodging alternative to hotels, but there's a proper place for everything. This is a land use issue, and the KISS solution is the best solution. To direct CPC to define STRs as a lodging use. That will be the key in aligning a Texas and Dallas code hotel definition of an STR with the Dallas Development Code lodging uses. With clear and easy to understand zoning, coupled with new regulations, everybody wins. Fact, these many hotels offer the same services as the hotels they imitate. They pay hot tax like a hotel, operate like a hotel, and are commercial business like a hotel. Fact, every owner is aware of the zoning of their property and what land uses are allowed. Ignoring zoning and operating in illegal land use does not create a vested property right. Fact, STRs are one of the reasons there's an affordable housing crisis. Fact, Dallas needs more homes, not STR hotels. And by the way, the figure is STR has produced 1,600,000 of income, not 200 million. Thank you for being with us today. Martha Heimberg, not present. Is Ms. Heimberg online? No. Okay, Martha, you're not online. Um, Mr. Cox is a duplicate. Ellen Beedling, followed by Jenny Alexander. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ellen Beedling. I have lived in my home at 7538 Marquette Street for over 30 years. Please adopt the Keep It Simple solution to zone STRs out of our neighborhoods and move the issue forward to the CPC. This should be an easy decision since prohibitions against commercial use and lodging already exist in the Dallas Development Code. There are people here speaking out against SDRs who have spent hundreds of hours voluntarily to justify the, to city officials the many reasons, not just party houses, they should enforce zoning regular ordinances that already exist. Why? Because we have the conviction it is the right thing to do, not just for us as individuals, but for the greater and common good of our neighborhoods, the city, and the generations to come who will want to live in stable neighborhoods. Please do the right thing and adopt the KISS solution. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Is Emil Lippi online? He was our speaker 42. She is showing online. If you're able to hear us, are you able to turn your camera on or to speak? Okay, we'll come back and see if we can get the technical issue resolved. Jenny Alexander and John Daly are our next two speakers. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jenny Alexander. I reside in District 6, 9943 Dresden Drive. I've been a resident of Dallas for 20 years and a homeowner for the majority of those. I personally make use of STRs in Dallas. While I survived the Dallas tornado and winter storm Uri, 
my home did not fare as well and required lots of repair. STRs provided me a clean, safe, comfortable place to land where I could work, cook, and feel somewhat normal and not have to stay in a hotel that was crowded with paper thin walls and sometimes sketchy parking. This was especially important during the pandemic. STRs mean that when older relatives visit and friends who use wheelchairs, I can rent a home that is more accessible than my own, that has stairs at every entry point and no walk-in showers. I'm against the zoning amendments that would remove STRs from residential areas and support regulation and enforcement that would punish the rare bad actor and not residents like me. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Was Emil Lippe able to get their technology result? I think we've lost them online. We'll circle back. I think we have Mr. Daly. Good yes. morning. Morning. My name is John Daly. My wife and I have lived in our house at 5839 Kenwood since May 12, 1989, where we raised our daughter. Our house was built with a, two front doors, one an entrance directly into a bedroom for a renter. Back then, renters stayed six months or longer. They were neighbors and friends. I'd like to keep it that way. Allowing the invasion and proliferation of STRs into our neighborhoods with the idea that regulation and enforcement will resolve issues will not work. Even my neighborhood's planning for parking, extra police, and trash pickup on St. Patrick's Day fails to meet expectations. STR Airbnbs don't know when a party will break out, surprising neighbors and police. Damage has already been done. Neighborhood serenity surrendered. And neighborhood security violated. With the housing shortage in our finite single-family houses exacerbated by the aggressive pursuit by corporations and investors purchasing the precious potential family houses of, for STR profits, our choice is non-residential STRs with potential and inevitable party chaos or single-family homes. Keep it simple solution. Choose family over STRs. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. William Hoyt, followed by Larissa Clark, then Stan Ayton. William Hoyt, not present. Is Mr. Hoyt online? Not online. Larissa Clark, followed by San, Stan Ayton. Larissa Clark, not present. Not online. Stan Ayton, followed by Kelly Nelson. Stan Ayton, not present. Not online. Kelly Nelson, followed by Bobby Clark. Kelly Nelson, not present. Not online. Bobby Clark. Hi, Bobby Clark. I live at 5534 Victory Boulevard and I support the Keep It Simple solution. I got involved in this because I live next to a problem STR, but I learned very quickly that the issue is much bigger than nuisance houses. The gold rush of investors buying up housing primarily to cash in on the STR craze is a huge driver of our growing affordab affordability crisis, and not just in Dallas, but globally. Dallas may be 86,000 units short of what we need, and every single short-term rental is a home that will not house a family. To even begin to address the affordable housing crisis, we have to drive more housing stock to long-term rentals. Prohibiting STRs in residential areas through zoning is the most immediate and important step the city can take to do that. And on the subject of platform accountability raised by Mr. McGregor earlier, the city can find Airbnb and the other platforms for unlicensed prohibited rentals. It's a key step for compliance. Uh, look to cities like Santa Monica and others that, who have done that successfully and beaten back the challenges by the platforms. Uh, platform accountability is really a critically important issue. Thank you for being with us. Mr. Lipe, can you hear us? We can see you, but we can't. Yes, if you'd please begin with your name and address. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, sorry for the problems. I'm old Lippy, 6828 Gaston Avenue. I've lived in the Lakewood area for over 40 years. I am in favor of the 
keep it simple solution, primarily because of security concerns. We used to have a very active neighborhood crime watch uh, that assists the police in performing their function. We've had a flurry of theft, auto thefts and uh, auto rummaging and auto uh, uh, damages uh, in people's front yards, not because of SDRs necessarily, but because we're unable to have active and effective neighborhood crime watch programs. We need to keep residential neighborhoods residential. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us today. Our next speaker is Taylor Meek, followed by Danny, we have first name only, followed by Jennifer Weirs. Taylor Meek. Taylor Meek, not present. Not online. Speaker 60 is Danny. Not present. Do we have a Danny online? Not online. Next speaker, Jennifer Weirs, followed by Mary Nagler. Jennifer Weirs. Not present. Hello. Not online. Mary Nagler, followed by Rick Bentley, followed by Patrick Block. Mary Nagler, not present. Not online. Rick Bentley. Rick Bentley is not present. Is Mr. Bentley online? Yes. Here, I don't know if I can get my face on the screen yet or not. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you yet. Start the video. That must be it right there. Oh, my. Here Mr. I am. Bentley, we can see you. Thank you. If you'll begin with your name and address. I'm Rick Bentley at 5551 Victory Boulevard in Dallas. And uh, I want to say that I'm all for SDRs, there, and there are plenty of wonderful places in Dallas for SDRs to legally operate. Single-family neighborhoods um, should not be places that they operate. They're, they know that, that uh, those that are in single-family neighborhoods already know that they're illegally in single-family neighborhoods, and, and we need to keep it simple keep our single family neighborhoods safe and, and free of SDRs and, and uh, let them operate where they should operate in, in uh, areas that lodging is allowed. Thank you all. Thank you for being with us. Next speaker, Patrick Block, followed by Jay. We have a first name only, Patrick Block. Short, simple. Patrick Block, but not present. I'm all for okay. SDRs. Put them up right where they belong. <laughs> Mr. Block, if you can hear us online, we cannot see you or hear you. Oh. Mr. Block, if can you can wave your hand. Yes, we can hear you now. Thank okay. you. Yes. And you can see me too? All right. My name is Patrick Block, and I live at 5806 Victor Street in East Dallas in a single family zone district. All of the complaints we've heard so far revolve around non-owner occupied locations. I'm a longtime Dallas resident who rents space out of my primary residence. This is the same residence used for my home exemption, voter registration, vehicle registration, tax returns, and so on. Dallas has long allowed homeowners to operate a business out of their homes and a sing and single family districts. I ask that you consider exceptions to allow homeowners to continue to rent out space from their primary property, just like any other home-based business is allowed to operate. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, speaker 65, David Giacco is a duplicate. Uh, speaker 66, Jay, we have a first name only. Jay, not present. Not online. Uh, speaker 67, also first name only, Roy. Is there a Roy present? 
not present? Not online. Judy Buckner? Judy Buckner is not present. Not online. Next speaker is Rob Stokes. I believe that may be a duplicate. Next speaker, Chris Heatherdale, followed by Tracy Williams. Is Chris Heatherdale present? Not present? Is Chris Heatherdale no, online? Thank you. Tracy Williams? Tracy Williams, not present. Not online. Greg Estelle. Good morning, Greg Estelle, 411 Bonstone Drive here in Dallas. I would like to thank Commissioner Hampton and the members of ZOAC for their consideration in the KISS solution. The members of ZOAC can now appreciate why it's taken so long for the city to get to this point. The lack of quality data provided previously to the City Council and today to ZOAC and CPC members still exists. It's been slowing the decision-making process. Using data from muni revs who continuously fail to accurately count the number of STRs is ridiculous. This kind of performance on a $495,000 contract would never be tolerated in the private sector. Yet even today, to answer Commissioner Hampton's questions, the staff continues to provide conclusions based upon that inaccurate data. Further, the lack of effort to correct a May 2021 report by a former Dallas Assistant City Manager, when more accurate data was subsequently provided by a City Council member, will not be a good look for staff when the STR industry continues to use this previously discredited report as a basis for their threatened litigation. City staff, you can do better. Okay. Please try. Thank, Thank you, you for being with us today. Next speaker, Amarachi Amagu. And I apologize for my mispronunciation of that. Amarachi Amagu, not present, the online. Thank you. Know. Next speaker, Steve Atkinson, followed by Laura Palmer. Steve Atkinson, not present. Is Mr. Atkinson online? Yes, he was on. Mr. Atkinson, if you're online, not, not online. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I thought I heard was online. Uh, Ms. Palmer, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. My name is Laura Palmer. I reside at 911 North Madison here in Dallas in District 1. Um, I support the Keep It Simple solution. Um, I think uh, our neighborhood has experienced a lot of changes um, in Kid Springs specifically. Um, with STRs. Uh, one thing that needs to be kept in mind is that for every home that is used as an STR, there's one less family living in that home. That affects our neighborhood schools. I'm standing before you as an advocate for our neighborhood school. We are fighting to keep our neighborhood schools and removing those homes affects them. I see more and more people walking down our street pulling suitcases instead of seeing families walking their children to the school. So I support the keep it simple and let's keep families in our neighborhoods versus transient guests. 
Thank you for being with us. John LaCosta, followed by Robert Lee. Thank you, John LaCosta, 6268 Sudbury Drive. SDRs are critical service to citizens of Dallas that we've heard from people who live in Dallas using SDRs in Dallas. They are also critical to uh, businesses, family and friends. They come in your neighborhood, the weddings in our neighborhood, the baptism, the bar mitzvahs in the neighborhood. SDRs are not hotels. We've misdefined this. People operate and live in and go to SDRs for different reasons than hotels. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. I'm going to read a statement. Dallas has scored another first again. The time for hotel occupancy in the pipeline. Dallas is number one in the nation. SDRs have the same tra trajectory. We need more SDRs, maybe regulated, maybe not ownership from out of state or out of city, but the need is there. We need to support the need. We also need to support an economic impact that, study. That's your time, Mr. LaCosta. Thank, Thank you for you being for with all. us. Robert Lee. Robert Lee is not present. Is Mr. Lee online? Not online. Thank you. That concludes our registered speaker list. We have three speakers, I believe, who are in person. Uh, first speaker, Mr. Luke Franz. Uh, Luke Franz, 2323 Ross Avenue. <clears throat> well, recognizing the, recognizing the sensitivities that gave rise to the short-term rental overhaul, in particular, the single-family neighborhood protections and low-dense neighborhood protections, we believe that there's been a modernized housing market that's been overlooked during this process. What we're deeming, a, and we called a mixed living community use, which was circulated by staff yesterday, um, is a managed housing product that modernizes and the way people live, which would encompass traditional 12-plus-month multifamily leases, would also encompass furnished, furnished units for short-term rentals and temporary rentals, and a managed housing option for leaseholders that would allow the managed operator to facilitate um, short-term stays in their units when they're out of town. This target demographic for this would be um, the evolving workforce, which are essential workers, remote workers, traveling families, and business professionals with heavy um, travel schedules. I want to emphasize this would be permitted, not permitted in single family neighborhoods or low density. This would be targeted for more urban dense uh, markets. The mixed living unit operator as established in the draft ordinance would require noise, noise mitigation and management, background checks, access, security, and all that kind of stuff. Um, we look forward to working with each of you in the, on the committee and staff in the coming weeks to talk more about this proposal that we think is a good solution. That's your time. Thank you, Mr. Franz. Thank you. You, you beat me to that. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Shelby Fletcher, followed by Lindy, Linda Howard. Is Ms. Fletcher still with us? Not present, Linda Howard. Hey, this is a first for me. My name is Linda Howard. I'm a 31-year uh, homeowner at 6008 Lord Court, and I want to say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, I didn't know what this was all going to be about, but from July 22, our SDR hotel guests arrived from Albuquerque, New Mexico to 6003 Lloyd Court, which is a Cold sack of 16. Ms. Ms. Howard, we need you to just speak into the microphone. I'm oh. not sure that our online uh, folks can hear you. You can, it I'm is flexible if you need to move it. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. Well, I have to read what it says. Anyway, um, SDR Hotel across the street from me. This vehicle pulled up. It's, uh, as you can see, oversized vehicle pulled by a crew cab pickup. And it had to. The traffic had to stop from uh, this, location, this location all the way, this location all the way 
the um, both side to both train is two way street stop all the way to Preston. In addition, in the month of July, we had uh, six strippers slash possible prostitutes uh, have this house for the weekend, and they six ladies came out in scantily g strings and pasties and posed for pictures in the front yard. They also a different group. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't very prepared, but prepared pictures are worth a thousand words. Thank you for being with us today. Are there any other speakers here who we have not heard from? Yes, ma'am. And if you'll please begin with your name and address for the record. My name is Erica Jordan, and I am actually a um, property manager for a property management company. We have four um, rental properties. Address. My address is, um, sorry, <laughs> my address is 714 Madrid Drive, Duncanville, Texas, uh, 75116. Um, we make sure that we regulate, um, we vet our people very closely. We take our neighbors into consideration we have noise aware that alerts us to um, noises uh, so that during the quiet hours, they are in compliance with the city. Um, we have, like I said, four rental properties and we have only had complaints on one rental property. And the only reason is because it is in an area where they are very adamant about no STRs and they have signs all over the place they make it uncomfortable for the guests, um, and they do everything that they can to deter um, people at that location. That is the only place out of the four where we have uh, had any complaints. So, so please don't. Your time. Thank you. But let me just finish this one thought. So please don't do something that's going to wreck it for everybody just because of a few bad apples. Thank you Thank for you. being with us today. Do I understand one of our prior speakers that we couldn't get online is available? So we have no one else here. We'll, okay, I think that's the end of our registered speakers list. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and um, thank everyone for being with us today, um, members. We're gonna follow up on discussion uh, so that we can close our action for today. Members, Mr. McGregor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> as I listened to all the concerns, uh, today there were, the majority of the people that spoke were against uh, STRs in single family neighborhoods, however, We've had in the past, and we did today, as we'll have individuals who think that properly regulated STRs uh, and limited number of STRs uh, would also be good. And I, I know that my thought at this point is that to get to the to the finish line on this, as far as Zoic is concerned, is is to find a compromise that satisfies everyone, if not 100 percent, hopefully 99 percent, and. Um, w one item that has not been included in this discussion that I would like to have staff look into into the future is the idea of including ADUs in this discussion because I think that if um, it, if we were to find a solution that allows individuals who living in their home rent out either their guest house or room it may satisfy a ton of the people that are that want STRs in single-family neighborhoods uh, because the corporations won't do it. So, so, in other words, if we if we if we look at something that has an um, as Denver I think does and a couple of the others that only allow STRs in uh, owner-managed properties, that may satisfy uh, th that may be a good compromise that everybody can live with. I don't know that I, I might go on to social media and do a, an unscientific survey, but uh, just wanted to throw that into discussion, Madam Chair, and ask staff to perhaps include it in the future reports. 
Can I may ask one follow up? I believe ADUs are on our next items list. Is that correct, Mr. Doss, or is Mr. Dre available? I got to hold the speak button. Um, so ADUs is on our work list, um, and it's actually on hold pending the STR discussion. So my question is, why aren't ADUs seen uh, included in this discussion? Because um, because it, it would make it easier for us to find a compromise if we if we have that. If, if right now we um, prohibit STRs and say we'll come back to ADUs later, we're going to have a lot of people upset. I believe the reasoning was that um, STRs are they're, they're related and they're not. They're kind of a broader you know, you can do an STR. Well, the question is, an STR in general, should it be allowed? Um, that's kind of a broader scope question than should we allow a second dwelling unit to be constructed on a residential property? And if so, how? So I think that um, we can certainly include some discussion and some research on ADUs and how it could be related to short-term rentals and how it could be related to this specific conversation on short-term rentals. I don't know that we'll be able to kind of do action at the same time, but we can certainly uh, include ADUs in our next discussion. Um, I'll, we'll see how best to do that. I guess I'm, I, I'm just not clear on why they can't be done together. They're both, they're both dealing with zoning code. They're both land use issues. Uh, why? And they're very much tied hand in hand because you know, there are many people that spoke in favor of STRs who did not say that they're really talking about ADUs. I know this because I know some of these individuals. They don't want to say that they're renting out an ADU because it's uh, it's not currently allowed under zoning code. May I ask a follow-up perhaps? Is one of the differences in, because I know we have an existing ADU ordinance. Um, it is an opt-in, it is through the Board of Adjustment, as I understand it, is an accessory to a dwelling unit versus the um, framework for the SDR discussion as a lodging use. So it's a, is that a consideration, both the period as well as the um, use classification that is being proposed? I, I, be, I believe so. There, there is the accessory dwelling unit opt in, overlay opt-in, which goes through all the way through city council. And then there's the additional dwelling unit Board of adjustment process. Um, that additional dwelling unit then cannot be rented. Um, so, from an STR discussion, that one is kind of moot. But um, I, I, th I think the, the, as I mentioned, we can certainly discuss it in tandem, and we can see where they where they overlap. I, and, and I don't mean to impose. I just uh, if it really, I would like, if possible, for the the rest of the committee members to. Weigh in on that. <laughs> I mean, my, my, my vote would be to include it, but uh, you know, there's many of us in this committee. Are there other comments? Commissioner Blair? Um, Mr. Enri, uh, Ms. Well, I can't even say com Mr. Commissioner. <laughs> um, I believe that I'm echoing. I believe that I'd be okay, so maybe that helps. Mm -hmm. this, is there another microphone? You want to try again, Commissioner Blair? Okay. Um, I, I believe that maybe the consideration, and I might be wrong, but maybe the consideration is that once the determination is made whether an STR is allowed in residential use, will answer the questions of ADUs. Now, if the question you're asking is if you want to consider an ADU as a um, opportunity for STRs, then I think that would be a different approach to looking at STRs. Then that would have to be determined first that 
one, STRs are allowed in residential. Do you, do it, am I right, Mr. Doss? Can you repeat that for me, please? You want me to repeat all that? <laughs> okay, so I think the consideration is that, and, and maybe the consider, I should say, maybe the consideration is that um, the thought behind whether that, that ADUs are not on the discussion for STRs now is because the consideration of STRs as a whole will answer the question whether ADUs would or would not be appropriate. If you look at ADUs separately, you can say you can do an STR at an ADU, but an STR in, in single family, would, it could be said no. So now you have, you, you have mixed messages, ADU yes, STR no. So does the STR override the ADU or does the ADU override the STR? So maybe that would be why staff is considering them separately and not jointly. May I, Madam Chair? It, 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 um, I think I, I agree with you, but I think what, we're, what, what I'm proposing we do is it will be a more, complete, a more complete conversation if we discuss the two at the same time. If, you know, and, and, and determine in that conversation what the interaction is between one and the other. I mean, they're really two different things. The way other cities have dealt with it in some ways to create type one and type two. But I just think the conversation would be more complete and more productive if we discuss the two at the same time. Thank you. But if we say STRs are not appropriate in, in, in single family, that answers the questions, can we do an ADU? So you, you, can't an, you can't say yes to ADUs and no to STRs. So I think the, the, the position right now is, do, do or does ZOAC as a body want to forward to CPC the determination that STRs are appropriate in single family, it be, and if we say that that's what we're going to send to CPC, or then are we how are we going to regulate it? Um, and then under the and if I'm and I, and I don't know 51A well enough to be able to to call the number, we have in our ordinance, we already have regulations on ADUs, but we don't have any regulations at all on SDRs. Well, um, I just want to make one observation is that this would definitely be an expansion of what's before us. So what is before us was a, over a two year process we were given guidance by council that was fairly specific to um, consider the definition of short-term rentals um, and classifying as a lodging use and that they permitted in zoning districts where lodging uses are allowed. We have a separate track that's already on the work list for staff to consider the accessory dwelling units. I understand your, your point that there are some similarities um, I believe how we've gotten to today is that we are to consider the short-term rentals knowing that the accessory dwelling unit discussion is coming back before this body and it may be informed by the conversations that we have today but they, that they were um, separately and I guess I had asked staff and Mr. Dre I don't know, want, know if you want to weigh in on this but it's not what we have noticed for. It has not been what our you know, charge has been in considering this request, or this matter, I should say. Yes, and I would make a distinction that the other authorized hearing, I think it's about accessory dwelling unit as a building, and I think this one is about the use. So 
that's what I would like to ask a clarification. It is indeed true that whatever decision is going to be made about short-term rentals is the use is going to obviously affect the building side of it. So I would like to ask a clarification. And I think, Mr. McGregor, I'm going to try to capture it, but you may need to speak. And so in considering the accessory dwelling unit, this is thinking about it and what many of us, I think, the garage apartment, the granny flat. And again, that's the additional dwell our building on a site that could potentially be a STR as a part of that discussion. And I think by defining this use, then that that is then considered when that discussion. Ms. Udre, is that the clarification you're looking for? Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense, Madam Chair. And um, I have to be honest, I was also anticipating that uh, the difficulty that we would have if, if as a committee we decide to uh, prohibit um, STRs altogether in single family neighborhoods, we are not addressing a good half of the uh, public's concerns who do want them there. And, 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 and that ADU piece, in my mind, would go a long way in, in um, satisfying everybody. But um, <clears throat> it's up to the committee to decide yeah. if you want to hear more of it or not. Thank you, Mr. McGurk. Commissioner Popkin. I think a solution to uh, the issue that you're bringing up could be that if we were to define a policy that allowed um, an ADU to exist as an STR with the proper regulations, such as the property owner is on the deed or you know some kind of indication that there's a property owner on site and there's a secondary unit available, then that opens it up to the process we already have at hand that can allow one to obtain permission to have an ADU in their neighborhood um, and then open us up to a continued conversation about changing that existing process. I agree. That's really well put and I agree with that. Thank you. Ms. Bagley. Yes, thank, thank you. And feel I, free to unmute and speak. I will, it's, uh, we can't always see everyone, so thank you. I, uh, I just have one concern and, and that I'd like, uh, and it will go to this uh, city attorney's office. Uh, I've been to a lot of zoning seminars and made presentations on zoning as well. And in the past, uh, there's, I'm not sure of all the case law, but been told that you cannot distinguish between an owner occupied and a rental occupied in a zoning ordinance. So I just want some clarification. I know they've said there's some, but there's case law out there both ways. And I want to be careful that we don't put ourselves in trouble. So I'm asking for a little more uh, research and information from the city's attorney's office for their whatever they're supporting. Thank you. Mr. Burgess. Yeah, um, in response to that, yeah, um, from Melania's perspective, I, yeah, I don't know if there would be a huge difference if it's owner occupied or if you had, say, necessarily a long term tenant that was occupying. Yeah, I don't really know what the difference would be there from Melania's perspective. So I think that would, I think that would be a hard, um, differentiation of made there. And we actually had an earlier question that had come up that we are aware that corporations are sometimes considered as persons and does that also speak to that issue? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think, I think the, the owner occupy thing, I think it's just kind of a, a difficult thing, but you know, if, if you really want to make the distinction, um, we could say a corporeal person, so we do have that, um, for instance, for fee waivers for Board of Adjustment cases that would allow an individual like you or me to go in and request that fee waiver, but it would keep you know, a corporation or a nonprofit from doing that. So we could use that word to make the distinction if we really want to. Uh, 
what I've seen is it's been a neighborhood protection issue to um, people trying to say you can't have a renter occupied, that everything has to be owner occupied. And I just want to be sure the distinction is there and you get it right as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bagley. Mr. Reeves. Yes, question for Mr. Uh, Burgess follow up. So if if we were to allow um, STRs in single family townhome and duplex districts, and then at some point, and, and we do, uh, I should say, we were to allow it with the, with the caveat that they're owner occupied. And then at some point in the future, um, it, it is taken to court and that owner occupied basically says, well, a company is an owner. And if an company's employee is there, that's, that's an owner. Then, so now we've opened up, we've opened back up Pandora's box where companies can, can do this and circumvent the owner occupied with our original spirit intent. So if, if we were to do that and then companies were to get that overturned, the owner occupied part overturned, can we come back to where we are and potentially eliminate single um, STRs and single family townhome and duplex altogether? So you, at, at that point, any that would be out there would have non-conforming rights. So they would get to continue to operate unless there is a board of adjustment case that um, you know a neighborhood brought and the board required compliance. And then, yeah, it's a little bit hard to speculate on whether we could do any other changes zoning wise going forward. Um, so, yeah, I don't, don't necessarily want to speculate on that right now. Well, my, under, my understanding with Austin was the, the city of Austin is that they had some rules that were overturned. And then when they tried to go back and strengthen those, they basically said, no, now you're taking away a right. So, my, my question is, is if we were to say owner occupied, and then the courts were to say, well, owner occupied is a company as well. Can, can we now go back or would we be taking away a right if we now tried to regulate them again in single family neighborhoods? It seems to me that it would be the kind of the same position that Austin found the city of Austin found themselves in. Yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit different scenario, but yeah, I think we could find ourselves in a similar situation as Austin. So the safe route might be to say no in single family duplex and townhome because that would be our that would be our ground set. And then to uh, Ms. Bagley's point, if we got ourselves in trouble down the road, um, we, we've got our baseline set. We've, we've made a ruling. Yeah, I think that would be preferable than trying to make an owner and non-owner distinction. Okay. Okay, and one other statement, Madam Chair, I, I do agree with your um, the, the purview of what we've been assigned to do. I, I think if we had started this process months ago on with um, ADUs in this, that would be a different thing. But here sitting in you know mid-August, I think it's late. It would have to be noticed. Um, the, you know, the, and the same thing with the Jackson Walker proposal. That might be a great proposal, but we got it at nine o'clock last night, and and that's not in our purview. Um, my preference today would be, I, and I have a motion ready. If you'll allow me to do that, to to move this on, let's take a vote. Maybe we get this to CPC. CPC can kick it back to us. CPC can re recommend whatever, change it, put it to council. Council can kick it back to us. So. Um, by saying no to ADUs today or the Jackson Walker pro proposal today doesn't mean that further higher up the food chain, it can't come back to us. So I think we're nibbling around the edges. I, I think it it's time to everybody to cast their vote and let's see what happens. If you want to proceed, Mr. Reeves. I, unless anybody else had prior discussion, I guess. I would say let's move to discussion of a motion. Okay. Okay, um, in the matter of DCA 212-002, consideration of amending chapters 51 and 51A of the Dallas Development Code with consideration to be given to amending section 51-4.216-1 lodging uses and section 51A-4.205 lodging uses to define a new 
use called short-term rental lodging and related regulations. I moved to follow staff's recommendation as, as in our um, uh, docket here um, with the following three additions. First of all, to add a purpose statement, which says to establish the purpose is to establish regulations for the protection of the health and safety of occupants of short-term rental properties, to protect the integrity of the districts in which short-term rental properties operate, and to preserve the neighborhood character of residential districts within the city of Dallas and to minimize adverse impacts to the housing supply caused by the conversion of residential use, uses units to transient use. I'd also like to add as far as multifamily, and this is for all the multifamily, that we limit the number of units to six or 10%, whichever is less. And lastly, I'd like to exclude short-term rentals from any multifamily development that has utilized the affordable density bonus. And if I have a second, I'll have some comments. Thank you, Commissioner Blair, for your second discussion. Yes, comments first? Uh, yes, thank you. Good reminder. Yes, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, short-term rentals are a commercial for-profit nightly hotel business in a residential district. Um, and, and I have kind of a key question. Um, where is the hotel industry on this? With, with 6,000 potential uh, units out there every night, you would think that Hyatt and Hilton and Marriott would be standing on the mountaintops before us screaming against short-term rentals, and they're not. And the reason that they're not is that they are getting in this bed as well. Um, you can go to uh, Marriott's platform. Uh, they manage STRs via their homes and vias platform. So Marriott is now in the short-term rental business. That to me points that this is a commercial business. And I, and I realize this, what started off as kind of the mom and pop, the, the lambs, the, the homeowning lambs, if you would, it's now been, it's getting taken over by the, by the wolves, the corporate wolves. So, you know, the hotel industry and investors have looked at STRs to expand their business, and it's eating directly at our affordable, affordable housing in this, in this city. Um, I think that's pretty obvious. Um, I am sympathetic to the lone single-family homeowner who is renting out a room, but the current code never guaranteed this right in single-family zoning. The current code was silent on that. However, these homeowners do have the ability to rent out one or more units in their home for a 30 day on a month to month basis. So this may not be the STR cash cow, which is causing the corporate and the investors to eat up our affordable housing, but it is a viable and profitable revenue stream. And um, I think to conclude, I'll, I'll restate one of our members of the public said, I'm not against STRs, I'm just against them in single family neighborhoods where hotels are not allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reeves, Mr. McGregor. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not, um, I'm not at all ready, and I think it would be premature to vote on this issue today. There are a number of significant unresolved questions, which we have actually asked uh, staff to pursue. For example, uh, just a minute ago, we we're still discussing whether or not it's possible to determine with accuracy whether uh, a property is uh, owner managed or not. You know, there are cities that have addressed this in a very good way by including uh, requesting in the permitting process a couple of uh, uh, documents like uh, voter registrations, uh, electricity bills, health insurance cards, where the individuals address show up regardless of whether or not the property is owned by an LLC uh, or in the name of an individual person. Uh, we have not done anything at all to address the number of small size operators who have spoken today and in the past and have sent emails saying that uh, at their scale, being good, operator, good operators, why should they be punished when it's only uh, the vast majority of STRs are, are good operators? We have not addressed the, the problem that uh, we know would happen by forbidding um, STRs in single family neighborhoods where uh, we don't know how we're gonna enforce it. We know that people will still operate as they are now. Uh, illegally, and, and we don't know how, how to enforce. And then finally, um, before I vote on an ordinance, I, I really want to see the entire ordinance with the details. I can't have it sprung on me in a motion uh, without seeing it in writing and really parsing through, uh, through all the language, including something that was brought up uh, last time, I think, about parking. 
what type of parking would be required? Uh, where would that be required? Would that happen in the code? Would, would we require parking in the permitting process? Uh, what does the permit look like? And so forth. So um, more than premature, I think it would be responsible to vote on this today. So therefore, I absolutely will vote no. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Are there other comments? Yes, I have another comment. Oh. Uh, I, so, I appreciate the uh, Mr. Reeves putting it all on the table today. My main concern is if we say they're no longer allowed or no longer going to be, it, we're not going to put them in the zoning order. How are the people, there's no plan out there right now for how to transition the people that are actually operating these uh, units now. And I would like to see that transition uh, plan at least explored uh, before the whole ordinance comes back to us. Thank you, Ms. Bagley. Mr. Hall? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think it's premature to vote on anything without seeing it in writing. Uh, so, I, you know, if I, if I want, am going to vote on something like this, I want to, <clears throat> I want to see it in writing and be able to, to think about it. Uh, two, I think the concept that because a few are bad, all are bad, uh, therefore we're going to eliminate all of them, I think is maybe, I'm not sure I, I would support something like that. So I, I would definitely like to see anything in writing before we vote on it. And just to clarify, Mr. And I think we may have actually lost our online. I've just noticed that we uh, have no video. Uh oh, I'm I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? We, well, we can see you, Mr. Or we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Video has just come back. We I think it was a connection issue on our side. Just to clarify, the motion was the um, provisions within our docket, which are on page five. Is that correct, Mr. Reeves? Yes, is that it your is. intent? Yes. And that, yes, with the, use, with the use tables, with the use tables on 12 and 13. Understood. And so, and that includes then districts where allowed, which would include, yep. and again, I won't read them all, but we, there, so there are districts where they're allowed, where lodging uses is allowed, parking is defined, um, there's a use definition proposed, additional provisions um, that they must comply with the um, short-term rental which is going to be separately defined and that there are um, the additional provisions that are in the docket. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And that other, you know, there's a couple of things that have been highlighted in the docket that have changed, but this, this, this information has not changed in three months as far as these use tables, um, it, the, as far as the parking and whatnot. So this is in writing. And thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I understood what your intent was, is that it was this essentially yes. the one page ordinance plus the use table. So, yes. and let's let everyone have first round. So other comments from members? So I'll go ahead and just make a few brief comments. You know, I, I do generally agree with um, Mr. Reeves that we've had the same one page um, in our docket since this came before us. It is consistent with what I understand our charge to be from the guidance that we've received from city council. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities. That's why I think we started to talk about owner occupancy. We started to talk about other provisions that might be appropriate to include within a potential ordinance. One of the things that I've come to realize in evaluating this is that there is a clarity in the simplicity of what is before us today. I think we would have a lot of opportunities to look at other items. However, after two years, what I'm hearing from all members of the public who are here before us, I think it's reflected in the number of those who are here to speak, is that we need to act. And that having a defined use as a lodging use, setting the standard for a district, allows us to advance the conversation. And I, I think that, you know, certainly accessory dwelling units are likely a component of it that is one that will be coming back before this body for separate con consideration. 
And I, you know, agree with Mr. McGregor. I think it may end up addressing some of these. I think the question is, goes back to the period of the use. That is the fundamental difference between our current lodging use definition and this proposed short-term short lodging. Where, where my thoughts are on this. So I think we, if there are no other comments, Mr. Baring or Ms. Popkin, we'll go to second round. Oh, did I see your hand, Mr. Baring? Yes, I, you know, I think um, I'll echo a little bit of what Mr. Hall said. I, perhaps we've seen this data, but, you know, how many of these are actually, have there actually been 311 requests filed on? Um, you know, the proverbial baby with a bathwater comment. Um, I think there's a lot of nuance to these, to these conversations. And I, I think, you know, while keep it simple is, is good branding for those on that side, it's, it's, it's keep it black and white when, you know, a lot of things in, that we're talking about are not black and white. Um, so I will not be able to support the motion, um, but I, I also, it, it, if it's in the data, I would love to see where the three one one requests have been filed and how many. So that for another time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baring, Commissioner Popkin. I'll just say that um, this conversation will continue through two more bodies. Um, I think we've asked staff for a lot of new information that has brought some great data and um, background info to light. Um, I know this has been a long, arduous process for a lot of folks. Uh, I, I like the idea of um, moving forward and continuing the conversation. I think this is a good starting place to bring in um, the, the rest of the plan commission and to continue the conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Popkin. Commissioner Blair. I second it. Um, so I'm going to support it, but I also recognize that there are bodies here that want to see more. Um, and I caution all of us in getting involved in what I call analytical churn, where you analyze, you analyze, and you analyze. Just with the Jackson Walker document we got last night um, that redefines multifamily use with STRs, I think that is something that can also be discussed at CPC at a full-fledged body. Um, I believe that we have heard over 100 people come before us and discuss STRs, the validity of them in residential, as well as the challenges. We've heard code talk about the opportunities to, um, to regulate and what it will mean to regulate STRs in, in single family or in a single family environment. We have had staff define um, what, ST, we, from what STRs are. I would not like to sit and churn it, and churn it, and churn it. I think it's time to move it forward. If we, if, if, and, and everyone here has the opportunity when it gets to CPC to come to CPC and express your desires, your discussion items, um, because that, that opportunity does exist again at CPC. Uh, Mr. Burgess has legalized us and legalized us and legalized us to, I don't want him to illegalize us because he's over-legalized us. So you can only analyze this so much. We can only discuss this so much. 
we have more things that are on our plate that we need to say grace over um, that we need to move forward, not, not overanalyze and not move backwards. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Blair. Do we have a second round? Yep, Mr. McGregor. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to clarify something. I don't, um, I, you know, in, in my business, we use the, because I'm analytical, we use the, the term analysis paralysis, which is a very real situation. And I, I, I don't think for me, that's what's happening here right now. Um, we have been through two years of information gathering here. I know it because I've been through every single part of it. Um, over the last few meetings, we, at every meeting we've been pressed for time. So we really did everything we could to get all the people to speak. And even when we had discussions, even the last meeting, which was close to the public, we were pressed for time. So we, in my mind, there were issues that I anticipated there was gonna be one more session of uh, fine tuning the language where questions like why is parking included in the code and not in the permit? How will the platforms be um, made to comply and what kinds of principles are we gonna put behind them? Um, there are a set of really important issues that we, we need to take those uh, through the finish line to, so that we, it's our role I think <clears throat> as a committee to send to CPC a document that's already been sorted out, not one that they'll spend another uh, two years uh, redefining themselves. So um, we have been at this for two years. I hate to send a uh, half-baked product because we weren't willing to give it one more session of discussion to fine-tune those t details, which I think are very important. So I, uh, I, I hope other uh, committee members see it the same way. And let's, let's send a quality product to CPC. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can Mr. I can I ask you a question, Mr. McGregor? If the chair allows, sure. I, if the chair, may I? Okay. Um, you said that there are items that you feel need to be addressed that have not been that that are within the def definition of what it is we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And you can, okay, can you identify very succinctly, it's this, this is what we, this is what we're supposed to do, this is the question that is left outstanding mm -hmm. that we have not in this particular body mm -hmm. answered, and here is the discussion item that needs absolutely, to Absolutely, absolutely, and I, um, I, I alluded to one earlier, how about if I just give you one as an example, but I'll tell you that there are more. I alluded to one, in the first round of questions this morning, which was parking. Uh, and I said, I thought it was a question, but it, it was really a concern. I thought I'd bring it up later. And, and the concern is this, right now we're requiring parking for STRs. We're putting in a, a requirement in the code. Well, we know from all the other work that we've been doing with parking reform that once you put parking in the code, it becomes, it'll stay there for 500 years. And if it's ever off, it needs to be adjusted. Uh, or adapt to special circumstances, we, we won't be able to do it. So one thought is that instead of putting parking requirements in the code, they'll be in the individual permit. That's a more flexible way to allow each individual case to have different parking requirements. So that, that's worth a good 10 minutes of discussion for this committee. And like that, there's probably eight other items that I think should be discussed. Um, if we vote today, all that goes away uh, with a lesser product than what we could have had. It's... Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Commissioner Popkin. Um, I'll, I'll concede to that. I, I don't see a problem with spending one more meeting carefully looking through all the details, answering any last straggler questions. Um, and making sure that what we're sending from CPC is, you know, a quality product. I, I, I personally feel like we've answered, um, I would say 95% of my questions and I feel confident moving it forward, knowing that I'll continue to be part of the conversation, but I recognize that um, there, there may be others that have a lower percentage of <laughs> questions answered and a higher percent of unanswered questions and that um, I, I would be just fine listening to those questions you have and answers that might come of it. Thank you, Commissioner Block and Commissioner Blair. Mr. Reeves. 
Yes, ma'am. Are you amenable to a friendly um, amendment to your motion? Well, and you can always make it. You can always make an amendment. <laughs> and that amendment would be that this particular body, if they feel that there are items that need to be addressed, that number one, would they identify each item in writing, send it to our chair and Mr. Arturo. They, and with that, that would mean every person would have to go through what, what we have and identify those particular items that need to be, that they feel, feel that we have not addressed so that staff can prepare the, the question and the answer or the item that needs to be, that, that we can net out that says needs to be discussed for one more discussion so that this can be brought to a vote. That would include that. That would include the Jackson Walker or change that we got last night. That, that because it's it's something new. If you're saying if you're going to do it for one, you got to do it for all. And and that may be that we just say no to that particular item. So to be clear, that would just be a discussion point for our consideration. So this would be directing staff to bring back an ordinance as recommended. No. Well, yes, that would be. With any questions. With a traditional cross out, you know, markup, would you change? And yes. Mark, with well, the then, markups the way we're used to seeing them. Right? And then. You know, Use that as a basis for our next meeting. Yes. And that would be with the, with the outcome, with the determination that, that the goal is to come to a final vote, a discussion. A markup, discuss, uh, identification of what needs to change, a markup of that change, a discussion of that change, and a vote. So if I, if I hear the motion correctly, so I understand, uh, it's... Requested friendly amendment. We don't have a... <laughs> we may have two votes. Mr. So. Reeves, do you have a problem with that friendly amendment? Uh, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how we can say I would make that amendment and we're going to wrap this up and we're going to vote at the next one um i mean if you look at parking we have a we have a uh a, a, a charge to look at parking throughout the city so why kind of spot zone this when we when, when we're going to look at it at the big picture and a lot of these districts where we will be allowing strs we're definitely going to be touching the parking across the board on those districts um and again, if if we send this to CPC and CPC wants wants to us to per, pursue a residential, uh, I mean a, a homeowner occupied um, allowance, then they will come back with that that specific directive. Or if they say we really like this Jackson Walker, we will come back with this uh, directive. So I, I think I'm going to respect respectfully decline, just because. What we have, what I propose is in black and white, and then we can actually get guidance in specifically because maybe they don't want us to talk about parking because we're going to be talking about, about parking across the board, especially in all these districts where STR is allowed. I think parking would need to be discussed in that context, not spot zoning it here. Um, so, and, and again, this is just a baseline. If we pass this, there's nothing. There's, you know, if city council said, uh, yes, we love this, there's nothing to stop us from coming back two weeks or two years from now to say, hey, we want to look at owner occupied or we want to look at this other thing. Uh, we're just asked to get something on the books. And, and I think it's time to move this on. It's been two years. And, and honestly, if I thought we could wrap this up in one more. I would I would say yes, but I, I don't think we can. So I'll respectfully decline that friendly amendment. Not a problem. So we're on second round of comments on the original motion to approve the item per staff or docket recommendation, the proposed amendments, uses as defined, purpose statement as read into the record with the additional provisions for multifamily uses and restrictions for mixed income housing density bonus projects. So second round, are there any comments on any additional comments or discussion? Mr. Hall. 
Yeah, I just want it to be clear. We're talking about what's on page five, which refers to this uh, use tables on page 12 and 13. That is correct. Okay, yes. and so if it's uh, this highlighted area, if it's not, it doesn't have a P by it, that would mean it is not permitted by right. That is correct. Okay. Mr. Doss, is that correct? A, a blank space is not, per, not permitted by right or by SUP. You cannot do it and there's no path to do it. And this is, the motion is to move this on to CPC. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Doss. Mr. Barry. And Ms. Bagley, you're next. So what, what would it look like then going forward to build a, if we, or CPC, I suppose, chose to do so, what would it look like to build in an owner-occupied provision in those other districts? Are we saying that's not off the table with this? No, not at all. It, it, I, I mean, my, my motion is to send this to CPC. If if they want to, uh, if they want to consider that based on all the testimony that they're going to get, then they will they will provide you know a pinpointed direction. They're not going to kick it back to us and say try again. They're going to say we don't like this, we don't like this, we want you to do this. And if they say we want you to address owner occupied, now we are meeting with a focus to address owner occupied, not this kind of you know, La La Land, where's Waldo? We're, we're just never going to get out of this loop, in my personal opinion. So I'm all for bringing it back, but let's let CPC decide that. Can I hear from staff on that, please? And this is a question if that's under the purview of CPC to do that. Is that what the question is? Right, right. I, yeah. I, don't, <laughs> I don't understand why that's why we're not addressing that now. Go ahead. Mr. Doss, thank you. So once uh, once the committee makes a recommendation to the City Plan Commission, City Plan Commission can um, take the recommendation as is. They will develop their own discussion. Um, they, they could make modifications to that and move it forward to City Council. They could remand it to the committee um, for you to look at again, either in general or the specific focus, whatever um, they move to do. Um, but the, the, the short answer is yes, they can make modifications as they see fit. City Council can do the same. Does that answer your question, Mr. Baring? Um, good enough, thanks. Okay, Ms. Bagley. Uh, again, on page 12, um, that we're talking about, we have highlighted areas with the strike through. Is that to be, con I want to be very clear that that eliminates those P's and S from that column. Mr. Doss? That is correct. The highlights are there to draw attention to the fact that those P's were present in the last case report and they have been struck through since that time. It, it just, I guess, because we said, as we've had it for, this has been the same chart for a while, it's not, it's been changed slightly. Yes, just a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bagley, for the clarification. Any other, Commissioner Popkin? Well, that just about covers the 5% of questions that I had remaining. Why were these struck? I, I thought maybe I just missed that part of the conversation, but now that we're here. Those were struck based on the discussion at the last ZOAC meeting about otherwise legally existing dwelling units that um, it, if they were in an R75 or an R5 district, if they were in a single family residential zone, they would, under this, uh, under these uh, potential amendments, would not be allowed to be used as an STR if they did otherwise exist legally as a dwelling unit and it's permitted in an IR district or an IM district, then this, for example, there are, there are entire neighborhoods of single family homes that are legally existing, non-conforming, but exist in a zoning district like IM or IR. If the ordinance was approved with those P's there, those entire neighborhoods could then theoretically be converted to short-term rental neighborhoods um, 
but they're in areas that are zoned for industrial uses. And so I, I, the, the direction we were kind of given to is to look at those and remove those out of that permitted list because um, of that kind of dichotomy. We, th those neighborhoods kind of fall in this gap of we're not really protecting them from anything because we're saying things are permitted and it's an industrial zoning district. Um, whether, whereas the same neighborhood, if it wasn't zoned industrial, would not be, STRs would not be permitted. Um, but that neighborhood still exists there. So that was why we, we struck those through based on that discussion. Okay, that's a really fascinating loophole. Thank you for clarifying that change. Thank you, Commissioner Popkin. I think on balance, I am gonna support the motion. Um, I understand the concerns of those who, you know, would have you know, liked one more review of this. Um, we do have the 311 data. I think similar to a lot of the data that we have discussed, I understand there's holes in it because the city doesn't have a mechanism for codifying STR complaints. They fall under general buckets. It was part of the um, discussion at um, city council and at the numerous briefings like uh, Mr. McGregor, I've also gone back through, I've listened to a lot of them, I've read a lot of them. Um, I think we always have the opportunity to improve the data. I certainly hope that is one thing that comes out of this process is that we'll actually have the ability to track it and understand it more fully. In consideration of the owner occupied, it's something that was a robust discussion at city council. It's one that I'd hoped that we may have been able to determine. And what I came to as I started reading the references that staff had provided to us from our last discussion is that there is so much complexity. It was interesting to hear Mr. Doss mention that the complexities of the New Orleans ordinance are unique unto itself and it's the one I've spent the most time with. He is not wrong. You know, but it, I, my fear is, is that by trying to craft those regulations and understanding how other provisions of the law are applied, it opens a potential door that we are otherwise trying to address. I do think we have other opportunities through the accessory dwelling unit discussion when that comes back before this body, similar to parking. Parking I know is going to come back and be a citywide discussion and the clarity of what is before us is the first step. Much like this body considered, in fact, am I mixed income housing density? We needed a program to start with to evaluate it, how it operated, to then understand where there might be further refinements. And I hope that as this goes forward to plan commission and ultimately the city council, I have full confidence that those who have been before us last two months will continue to do so. With that, I will call the vote if there were no other comments. Thank you all. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask if we can, well, let's try voice vote and we'll go record if we need to. <laughs> so all in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? Nay. Nay. Nay, or yes, sorry. C Commissioner Popkin is a yes, so we have Baring Hall, you're an A. Okay. So we have um, McGregor, Hall, Popkin, and Baring opposed. We have Reeves, Bagley, Blair, and Hampton in support. So we have a 4 4 vote. And am I correct, Mr. King, that that moves forward to Plan Commission? That doesn't pass. No. No, no it does not. So that does fail. Okay. So do we have a second motion? I'm gonna take a pass at a second motion, if I may. To direct staff to bring back the ordinance uh, per our motion that was just read for consideration by this body at our August 30th meeting. I second that motion. So we have a motion by Hampton, second by Mr. McGregor. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all for the robust discussion. We'll be back on the 30th on this. Our final agenda item. Thank you. 
Um, our final agenda item is the approval of the minutes from October, or excuse me, October, I'm getting very far ahead of myself, from August the 2nd. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Thank you, Commissioner Blair, for your second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, one, so our next meeting will be on August the 30th. I'm also going to ask staff if they will bring forward a consideration of their ZOAC meeting schedule. I think we're going to continue to have a number of items before us and to consider uh, moving our meetings for the balance of the year to Tuesday prior to plan commission meetings, essentially the, the meeting schedule that we've had for August. So I would ask their staff to have that on our agenda for our next meeting. Any other discussion? With that, thank you all for being with us. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Mr. McGregor, Mr. Hall for your second. And we are adjourned at 1240 p.m. Thank you all and thank you for all the members of the public for being with us today. Thank you.